Okay, good morning everyone and uh, I now declare the meeting open to the public and online and I'd like to welcome all of our members who are participating by video conferencing today. Can I remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? And members, um, due to time constraints, due to time constraints members, uh, we, with, with your permission, we'll go straight to our briefing with the Minister and come back to other items then after we have we have uh, had our present. Are members content with that? Yeah, thank you. Okay, members, so we're moving then to our COVID-19 disease, disease response briefing from the Minister of Health. I refer you there, members, to your papers at tab 5 of the pack. I can advise members that the Minister is here this morning and the Chief Medical Officer to update the committee on the pandemic. So we'd now like to welcome by video link, Mr. Robin Swan, Minister of Health. Good morning, Minister. Morning, Chair. And Dr. Michael McBride, Chief Medical Officer. Good morning, Dr. McBride. Hi, good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Yeah, thank you. So we're both seeing and hearing you both. So um, you're very welcome today again. And could I invite you then, Minister, go ahead and brief the committee, please. Um, thank you very much, Chair. And look, uh, I'll keep that short as per, per previous briefings um, to allow more time for questions and engagement. Uh, Chair, as we know, good progress has still been made. The number of people in the hospital with COVID-19, although still high, uh, and there is growth uh, in, in case numbers slightly again. Um, and we hope that that severe pressure doesn't follow. Um, therefore, I must emphasise that if increase in social contact goes again too quickly, we may find ourselves back in the, the cycle that we've seen. But we know the rollout of the vaccination programme um, continues to make good progra progress and is expected to have a substantial impact on the epidemic in, in the medium to longer term. This week, we, uh, we have opened book into Priority Group 7, and we expect this to be followed quickly by other priority groups with the aim of offering everyone in the JCVI Priority Groups 1 to 9, um, that's those age 50 and over, uh, a vaccination in April. That will be a monumental step in, in a population-wide vaccination programme. We will then quickly proceed to those 18 to 49 um, uh, in that age bracket. As the vaccination programme continues, its rollout is expected to be expanded to include community pharmacy stores uh, across Northern Ireland, in addition to our GP practices and the regional vaccination centres. And as I've highlighted before, there is um, ongoing risk of, of increased transmissibility, transmissibility from new variants of the virus that have been identified elsewhere. Uh, and in, in addition, in the past uh, week, cases of the South African variant have been confirmed in Northern Ireland and in Scotland and England. And uh, cases of the Brazilian variant, as has been, been called or identified, have not been reported here. The full impact of the, the new variants will only be seen when measures are relaxed and the R number may rise more than would previously ha have been the case. Um, Chair, I, I welcome the publication of the Pathway to Recovery document by the Executive uh, to provide assurance for, for all of us that there are plans for the economy and for society to reopen uh, when it is safe to do so. However, it is critical that we do not respond to the success of the vaccination programme and the announcement of the recovery plans by, by letting our guards down, because now is, is not yet the time to do that. Uh, we don't want to see more cycles of relaxations uh, or lockdown again, uh, with all the harm that that actually brings. We must take those small steps uh, and watch the consequences to, to avoid the return to the epidemic growth of the virus. As the pressures from this wave begin to reduce, uh, I'm turning my mind yet again to, to the rebuilding of, of our services. I made it clear to officials that I expect to see action to repair uh, some of the damage and the delays that this virus has inflicted. And I'm aware that the committee is to get a full update next week. Uh, but needless to say, the waiting list position in Northern Ireland um, is not good, and, and we know that. I've agreed that the health and social care system should follow some of the key principles uh, as we de escalate ICU and rebuild elective care services. These principles include the need to de-escalate as a region and that the Nightingale facility in Belfast City Hospital is prior prioritised uh, for de-escalation. That's because Belfast City Hospital normally hosts our complex high-priority surgery on behalf of the region. Uh, so I'm keen that we scale up this high-priority surgery 
as quickly as possible. And this can be achieved by initially creating green pathways as they become known elsewhere uh, on the site and eventually turning the Belfast City Hospital in itself into a green site which will serve the region. Uh, and that will be facilitated by delivering critical care for COVID-19 patients at the Mater Hospital once again. Uh, elective care rebuild must reflect uh, a regional prioritisation to ensure that those most in clinical need, regardless of place of residence, are prioritised. And at the same time, uh, all trusts should seek to develop green pathways and begin to schedule this later this two to three weeks in advance. Uh, that aim will be for for allow us for any given staff and availability to actually maximise maximise theatre throughput. Uh, I've also asked our trust to proceed with developing ambitious uh, rebuild plans on the basis of, of these three principles to cover the period. The initial period will be from April to June, and I intend to publish these chair. Uh, I'll publish these in due course. Uh, so I'm now happy to take take questions or comments from members. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you, Minister. And um, I do want to acknowledge the continued the continued uh, benefit that the rollout of the vaccination program is bringing. I think that's certainly um, something that does provide um, some cause for hope, but as you say, not cause for complacency. Um, so that is. So, listen, and I know you have given us some detail there, but in relation to the red flag cancer surgeries, where are those at at present in terms of of a uh, what where each thrust are in relation to completing those red flag and other life life save life threatening conditions. Sorry, I'm not I'm not hearing you there, Minister. I'm not sure. Clerk, can you hear the minister? Apologies, Chair. Oh, we lost you there, Minister. Oh, yeah. Apologies. Okay. Uh, no, Chair, Chair, as you're aware, we we've now looked at that as a regional approach that we first step in and rebuilding. Those, those specific surgeries. So we are seeing surgeons, we're seeing teams willing to, to travel, we're seeing patients uh, now willing to travel as well. Between the 1st of January and the end of February, um, we had 1,076 um, surgeries either will actually cancel. Uh, to date, 86.2% of those have been rescheduled or completed. So there's 149 of those are still being worked on. Uh, to get them into the theatre slots that we have developed and are developing as well. So, so that, that level of uh, those still waiting is continually decreasing over the past the past number of weeks as well, Chair. So it's, it's a piece of work that is ongoing. As I say, we, we established that, or we have established that regional board where there is a prioritisation now of patients uh, at a regional level rather than solely at a trust level at this stage. Okay, and is there a particular difficulty, or, or uh, do you have concerns around paediatric surgeries? Is that something that that is particularly concerning, or uh, do you have anything in terms of update on that? We, we did. We met with uh, actually met with the, the paediatric uh, surgeons uh, just over over a week ago, uh, chair, in regards to access for facilities as well, and we are maybe looking at trying to get a regional centre uh, established specifically for those. In, and I suppose those high level uh, pediatric surgeries that we may need to take forward. So again, it's about why we move through these rebuilding plans, uh, opening uh, accessibility to footprint provision that we already have to those keen, those those teams chair that are keen to get back uh, and working on their their specialities and the lists the lists that are there. Okay, thank you, and um, Minister. Um, I know that that around recently there have been some difficulties around the vaccination program in relation to the rollout to carers, and it's very welcome that carers were identified. That very important cohort were identified. Um, would you agree that the the lack of detailed information on who on where carers are and who they are within each trust that that register is has been part of the issue in relation to that and is that something that's being looked at in terms of how we because obviously if we can't identify those people it's more difficult to sign post or get support to them so in 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 response to that uh, becoming uh, obviously raising its head as an issue have you done anything there to try to uh, ensure that trusts have an accurate register of who is a cure within their within their area but chair i think you've had one of the difficulties buying on 
nail, nail on head, shall, shall we say, and is that the fact that uh, not just in health in Northern Ireland, we don't have a central carers register. So should it be carers that are connected with ourselves, carers that are connected through Department of Education as well? There is no central database. So when we started uh, down the road of uh, allowing carers to access the vaccination programme, Traditional Donnelly actually had a very uh, detailed and engaging sessions with all our care representation organisations, which maybe aren't even identifiable or notifiable to trusts uh, as well. So that's why we took that approach at the start. But the work about establishing that central carers register is something that we're keen to progress uh, when we have the time and the space to do it, Chair, because it is vital in supporting those people who need that that support to provide the care that they are doing. So it's a, it's a piece of work that that will be will will be undertaken if I can get um, the, the time and space to get to it. But it has to be one that is cross departmental as well, Chair, because carers just aren't solely based uh, in health and within health trusts. So we need to get that central database so we can make sure we can support everyone. Yeah, and and I do recognise that that time and pressure are, are all those factors. But I suppose my particular concern is that those carers, because a lot of the COVID response impacted directly on those carers, the services closed, um, and and a lot more of the care and responsibility, which was already quite onerous, went on to them. So I would urge you to to sort of um prioritise that. And just just in terms of a quick update, then you have said you've been you're you're looking at potentially a one off payment for cures. Can you give us any update in terms of COVID in recognition of the COVID burden? Can you give us any update on that? Uh, and, and again, Chair, it, it is proven difficult, and it's proven difficult for for the exact reason you've raised is the identification of, of carers. So uh, I have a paper produced in regards to that because it is so uh, cross-cutting. Um, there is a paper that I have prepared ready to go to the executive in regards to that, because the further we get into it and, and the, the groups that we try to identify or process payments to, it's not something either within the, the, legal, the, the legal locus or, or the ability for us to have payment mechanisms. Whereas there may be other departments that have easier payment mechanisms that we can do that. We have we have set aside a, a sum of money to enable us to do that. So it will be looking to to support from the rest of my my executive colleagues uh, in regards to actually processing um, those payments as to where they go. But chair, um, I think you'll know you know as well as I do that that support is there. I think across the executive, but it's how we actually process that and identify the people that that, that are uh, and should receive it. Okay, and then um, finally from me, Minister, before I go to members, then I, uh, a number of us last night did a meeting with, with uh, Furnace and Fertility and with, with, with members of the public from across the north who are affected by the postponement of IBF services, um, and I know that, that that's a, a difficult issue along with many others. However, one of the issues raised in that meeting was that people who were on the list or who may that that uh, because their service was postponed due to COVID, that no one whose whose procedure was postponed due to COVID would be penalised on the basis of time. Could you commit that that would be the case that no one would fall out the system as a result of something that was beyond there or anyone's control? I think that's a commitment that we actually did make uh, during the first um, locked our first lockdown chair when those those services were reduced and we actually even increased you no know, age range capacity. As well, because that had been a restricting factor in the past as well. So, no, look, chair, we're working to work with with anyone to make sure that if they were uh, on the list or for the start of treatment, to make sure that they they progress through the treatment that was stalled um, due due to COVID and due to us having to to step down services for that period of time. And do you know? Do you have a date now for the resumption of those services? Um, I, I think the Belfast Trust is due to start those though shortly, Chair, if they haven't already commenced them uh, on small scale. It is something that I prioritised or asked to be prioritised during the first wave, so it is, it is something that is known within the Trust that it's, 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 a, it's, it's something that I want to see started. Michael, do you have a specific... Uh, yes, just to say you're correct, Minister, that it has uh, restarted, although uh, it, with particular cases in terms of... Uh, the, um, those individuals, for instance, in relation to sort of um, some of the more complex uh, cases, uh, that has restarted at uh, a small scale, and I think the trust is committed to um, uh, increasing the service provision 
as soon as is practically possible, which is obviously, as Minister said, something that we all wish to see. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Minister and Chief Medical Officer. I'm going to go then to members for a question. So I'm going to, at this point in time, I have indications from Chiara, Jonathan, Jerry, and Paula. So I'll go to you first then, Chiara, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair, and I'd like to thank the Minister and Michael uh, for being here again today. Um, I have a few questions. Um, one of them is around a stock and supply of the vaccine. I know earlier this year, Patricia had said um, there was a number of difficulties at the start uh, with shortages. I'm just wondering, uh, as we veer into uh, coming up to the point where we're about to vaccinate the general population later in the year, do you foresee uh, any issues with uh, stock and supply and what assurances can you give the public that it won't be an issue? Thank you. Um, thanks, Karen. I think that's always something we've been uh, very conscious of when we talked about next steps in our vaccine programme. We are dependent on supply chain um, and we get an indication, our usual indication leads up to maybe two, two and a half months in advance as to what we're indicated to get. So that's always what we we plan for it for as well. So those reassurances are very much based on the, the, the surety of supply that we get. What we've seen is what we're being uh, told we're going to get. We usually do there or thereabouts. Uh, the additional challenges that we we'll see uh, now, which we have to factor into the programme, uh, although we're, we're moving into other cohorts, we are also moving now into the phase where people will be entitled to their second vaccination. So the ones as well. So it's about how we manage uh, both vaccine supply, but also our vaccine program facilities, staff as well, and the entire logistical program around that to make sure that we're still bringing people forward uh, from the first vaccination, but also that people have the vaccine and the ability to get their their second vaccination slot slot as well. But that, that's all. And, and I know you've had regular updates from Patricia, and you'll know that detail is is there in regards to what what she has planned out. But you know, we, we always look to that two, two and a half month uh, projected cycle to make our plans as well. We don't call people forward unless we are sure that there will be vaccine supplies for those cohorts. Thank you, Minister. Um, my next question refers to COVID passports. Um, we've seen over the past number of weeks, uh, it, it's been an issue uh, within the news and a few constituents have reached out seeking clarity on the matter. So I'm just curious if you foresee uh, COVID passports uh, within Northern Ireland, for example, for access to services or to travel, uh, if you have any updates on that or any concerns. Um, uh, thanks, Cara. Uh, it, uh, it's one of those very topical conversations uh, at this moment in time, there's a uh, Four Nations, uh, call last night at First Minister's level, uh, which I was part of, and I know it's a piece of work that um, Her, Her Majesty's Government are actually undertaking as to what that looks like. It will bring particular challenges, um, especially for us, um, because if we introduce a, a COVID certificate or passport or whatever it, it may deem to be about access to services, especially, it's how we match that as well, and that's something the Deputy First Minister raised about how that's concurrent across these islands. Uh, not just throughout the United Kingdom as well. So, uh, I, I, uh, I suppose the additional challenges, uh, as well as how they're perceived on an international basis, mm -hmm. well, if some countries insist on having a, a vaccination certificate or passport prior to entry for holidays and things like that, it is something uh, that we will have to develop to allow that greater part of travel. It's not something, uh, and I, I'd be honest, it's not something from a political point of view, a personal point of view, that I think we should ever develop in Northern Ireland that we would need to provide um, certification of vaccination to enter a cinema or to enter a restaurant. Um, that's not something that sits, sits comfortably with me. Uh, in regards to proof of, of international travel, uh, we already have those you know, you know, in, in certain regions for, you know, for yellow fever certification, for vaccinations, things like that as well. So it may become an international requirement uh, of that proof, but to access services would be something that I think, um, I, I don't think the executive or I don't think the assembly would be entirely comfortable with. Okay, that's, that's a good answer. Thank you, Minister. Uh, my next question refers to a change in service provision. Uh, I was looking over our table of papers there um, on point 8.25. It was regarding addiction inpatient services, which have been temporarily stood down uh, within the Northern Trust. I'm just wondering if you have any clarification uh, around why this is or when we foresee it uh, you know, being restored fully. 
Um, I'm just mindful, I was looking through the notes and under active outbreaks, the Northern Trust wasn't mentioned. So I'm just curious, uh, you know, just to clarify why why these have been temporarily stood down and is it due to staff redeployment? Cara, you know, and I think I, I think you actually answered, you, so unfortunately you, you answered your own question. Yes, it is due to, to just staff redeployment as well because you know, and, and if any of our, our delivery services that we've had to stand down they are taken in regards as to what staff we need to redeploy, where they can be redeployed from. But one of the things, and I think in my opening statements as well, when we look to those rebuilding services, and again in the fertility uh, services that the, the chair mentioned, it's about how quickly we can get those services to back up again, because we do know uh, they're there for they're there for a reason, they're there for a cause, uh, and it's about getting them back there to, to support and serve the people that actually need them. Thank you, Minister. And just on that, do you foresee, is there a time scale or has there been anything identified when these, these crucial services will be restored? I, I don't, Cara, today to have, have that, that detail for the Northern Trust uh, services as well, but certainly if it's not in your briefing or not answered later on, if, if the clerk gets in contact with the department, we'll get you the update on that. Thank you, Minister. And then just one more question. Um, just around gym closures, um, we know that uh, I'm sure other MLAs share um, that we've had a lot of people, uh, you know, asking questions around the gyms that creates a sense of community for people. And um, yesterday at the dual diagnosis APG, um, a man called Gary from Derry and Arc Fitness had talked about, um, you know, the use of gyms to help people recover from drug and alcohol dependency, the sense of community and the sense of hope and support that, that creates. And I know with the pathway being announced um, earlier this week, I'm just wondering if you could give us, um, you know, any updates on how uh, the decisions around gyms reopening will take place. Well, well, Cara, I think that'll be taken in the round, you know, when we look at any any relaxation or any step that we take as an executive in regards to you know, the relaxations that the, the come at specific times as well and where the, the priority is and you know, the overall balance and the assessments that, that are, are made with each step. I think one thing we have to be conscious of is that each small bit that you open, no matter where, no matter what it is, has a cumulative impact. So where we all may think, you know what, a certain activity only has a small impact. If there's another certain activity has another small impact, when you look at the overall uh, cumulative effect that all those small steps have, they do have, they, they, they do have an effect on what we're trying to do. So it's why the executive uh, takes that, uh, I suppose, proportion, proportionate uh, response to where we see the different measures and take those steps at the right time as well. So we, we understand, and the chief medical officer has been in record on you know, the regards to the benefit of physical physical activity as well, both from, from not just physical well-being, but also mental well-being as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Cara. And just, uh, just to indicate to members that we are a little bit tighter for the Minister's time this morning, so I appreciate everyone um, both questions and answers being succinct as possible, as they have been today. So thank you for that. So I'm going now to Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we hear you. Okay, Joe. Uh, thank you, Minister, and thank you, uh, Michael, for coming to the committee this morning. Again, I fully appreciate the difficult job that you are involved with at the moment. Uh, it's, it's certainly not easy, and our, our vote of thanks for, for everything that is happening within the health service. Um, I suppose probably I do want to talk about the pathway to recovery. Um, I, like many others across the country, looked upon the document with a lot of frustration. Frustration with a lack of clarity, etc. For, for a reopening, and also uh, a frustration at the lack of involvement that the committee had uh, in, in prior to the release of the document and talking about it and in that a potential way forward, given that our central role throughout this pandemic. Um, and I suppose probably it's maybe a question for, for Michael at this stage, but I understand there has been, you know, there's been significant forecasting and data, a data approach is what we've been told that the document is, and significant forecasting has been carried out right throughout COVID-19 in terms of monitoring press on our hosts, etc. Could you maybe elaborate where that data comes from to begin with? And if it is the case that this document is data focused and not date driven, why couldn't we then use the data to provide indicative dates to give people a, a, a sense of direction in terms of timescales that they can prepare for a potential reopening if the data is consistent with your forecasting? 
Uh, maybe just, Chair, if I could come in in regards to, to the document itself, because I do notice uh, you know, Johnny's comments in regards to the committee not being involved. Um, um, it wouldn't be up to us to involve the committee in an executive document pre-release, um, Johnny. This is an executive pathway. It's not, it's not solely a Department of Health document. In fact, we represented it with it, so we could give our, our input into it as well. So, look, in, in regards to your comments about the frustration, uh, we want to be honest and not wrong with people. Uh, while there is the hope of better days ahead, uh, putting in dates now for possible relaxations week away, weeks away uh, could not be done with confidence or certainty. And as an executive, we understand you know, the businesses need time to prepare to reopen. Uh, so we'll continue to engage with all the sectors and work in partnerships uh, for a safe reopening when the time is right. Each relaxation uh, will need to be informed by the impact of the last uh, on community transmission and the RT number. And the executive is committed to a four-week review cycle where we will monitor the data on a range of health and societal impact before considering what relaxations can be made safely. Um, so while acknowledging that, Johnny, that's the opening paragraph um, from one of the documents co-signed by the First uh, and Deputy First Minister. Uh, in regards to how this document was constructed, how it's, it, it's set out as to the approach it takes and, and in regards to the approach that was agreed by, by, the, exa uh, by the executive. Uh, in regards to, to the data, and again included in the document as well, as it actually says we will continue to offer a broad range of data, information and statistical indicators to inform our decisions on whether to relax restrictions or whether we need to return to, to strengthen them. Uh, health trends that we will look at, as we've always looked at, will be based on World Health Organization conditions uh, for adjusting restrictions, those include maintaining the RT number, uh, health service capacity for COVID and non-COVID, test, trace and protect, population immunity, which now includes benefits from our vaccine program and the emergence of, of new variants. Um, it also states that economic data and indicators are critical uh, to ensuring that decisions will have the best impact on starting the road to economic uh, recovery as well, and, and they're listed. So I, I know um, I know the frustration that you're, you're 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 expressing, but I do need to be clear that the pathway document uh, is one from the executive, and that's why I thought it was important just to make sure. I, Minister, I, I, I understand that it's an executive document, and it's and I have read it by the way. So I'm just saying that I wanted to know, given forecasting, which we are told. Uh, throughout COVID-19 has informed decision making regarding uh, I think it was you know talked about at the time in the run up to Christmas that there was a forecasting of the pressures on our hospitals uh, and how that would then lead to restrictions being needed to be put in place given that forecasting why can't we use forecasting to give indicative dates for uh, if the if the data stayed as it were and the forecasting model was accurate maybe uh, Michael could answer that question that we could then give some form of clarity to industry uh, as to um, the forecasting models in line with a potential date for reopening. Michael, do you want to come in? Yes, uh, 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 thank you uh, for, the, for the question. Um, we've never done forecasting. Um, we've never made predictions. Uh, what we've been be doing, relying on throughout the course of the pandemic is actually modelling on the very uh, criteria and metrics that the measure uh, the minister has just uh, outlined uh, the number of, of cases um, the pressures on our health service uh, and on the basis of that modeling and modeling is not forecasting and it most certainly is not predictions um, ministers indicated and, and the, certainly the the document is I think we need to bear in mind a um, public facing document and on, on page 7, 27 as you as you're aware, it does, as the ministers outlined, clearly articulate uh, those measures that will provide us uh, with an assessment as we walk our way back out of restrictions, the answer to several important questions. The first important question is, do we have the epidemic still under control? Yes or no? Uh, and there are certain measures and the number of cases uh, is one of those. Uh, the number of uh, positive uh, cases, the percentage of positive tests, is another is that under control and we now know and are used to those sorts of numbers so they are numbers really important if it gets above one the epidemic is growing we don't have it under control if we keep the number of the percentage of positive tests well below five percent and consistently below 
at 5%, then we know, and that's the WHO criteria again that the Minister has alluded to, then we have the epidemic under control. Is our hospital, and that's just some of the, the questions that we will be looking and some of the data streams that we'll be looking to inform decisions about whether the epidemic is under control. How many cases are related to background community transmission from our surveillance systems? Uh, we would like to see a low level of those, and, more, and any cases we do see related to clusters and outbreaks, and that with our contact uh, tracing system, uh, that we're identifying all of those contacts. So those are the clear measures and metrics which will identify whether we're getting and have the epidemic under control. Similarly then, are we able to continue to provide health care, as we've been discussing earlier, uh, for non-COVID and for any so surge in, in COVID cases? Uh, but as I say, those WHO criteria uh, that the Minister has alluded to are in the public domain uh, and are accessible. Okay, and, and finally, I suppose, because I think we have explained a lot there on, on that. Um, so g given then, can somebody confirm the exact stage that we are at at present, okay? And then given the review dates... Very, very, briefly, very briefly, Johnny, very briefly, Jonathan, please. 13th of May. Those review dates, if the data stays consistent with uh, what is being presented at the moment, will those review dates lead to moving to the next stage uh, but date by date, given what's in the in the pathway to recovery. So our, our, answer, modeling, please. So our, our modeling wouldn't be we, we wouldn't have never been able to go that far in advance, Johnny, for, for what we have, and that's why we put in those specific review dates. Because one thing we have been clear about is is by each step that we do take, we take time to actually assess what impact it has had before we go go to the next phase as well. So while those four dates are there are specific review dates to, to regulation, um, I, I would be cautious and I would caution people not to see them as the exact date where we move to each stage, um, because I think what the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have both indicated as well, that there may be uh, opportunities where we can move down one of those nine pathways actually quicker. Uh, should the indicators take us in that direction, or there may be move, some that move slower, and that's the approach we took in, in uh, coming out of the first uh, lockdown phase as well. So we we took those steps that were proposed in that time, and that worked for us. That's why we got into such a good position here in Northern Ireland during last summer. Thank you. Okay, and thank you, thank you. So, um, and I going across then to uh, well, first of all, just to, to just let members know at this stage, I have Jerry, Carol, then Paula, Pam, Carol, and Arlea indicating in that order. So, uh, go ahead, Jerry, please. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Mr. TMO. Minister, we've obviously talked a lot about mental health in, in, in the previous times you've been up with the committee, but I want to hone in on some particular aspects uh, of it. Um, just two, two weeks ago, the 123 GP campaign released figures showing a, a lack of uh, in house um, counselling services and GPs. Some 50% of GPs in my own constituency, West Belfast, don't have any in house counselling services, and we have a high um, problem with health issues in our community. And it's very, very worrying and set the increase with the aftermath of the pandemic, whenever that is. Uh, so, a couple of questions pertaining to that, Minister. Um, what assurances uh, could you and your department give that nobody will be forced to wait more than 28 days before they get access uh, to a counsellor? My understanding that is uh, there's no targets at the minute to increase in house counselling. Um, there's no measurement waiting times in GP um, services. Uh, and my understanding is, is that is not uh, the GP in house service is not mentioned in the mental health uh, draft. Um, strategy. So, uh, just a few of your response to those questions, Minister, and I'll follow up with any any uh, replies. Um, thanks, Jerry. Look, in regards to to the GP and house services, those are services that GPs can can bid for to to have access to uh, in their surgeries and their provision as well. So, I, again, because they're GP surgery based, uh, it would be up to GP surgery to approach to. To, to seek that support or that provision, the same as the multidisciplinary team support and provision um, as, as well. So there is, you know, there is steps that, that we take to, to do that uh, and, and support it as well. Um, so it is, uh, it is work that, that is ongoing, um, and I think where necessary, people with uh, mental health are referred by their GP to secondary care mental health services 
uh, an NAO from each across of the five trusts. As a single independent contractor, GPs have the choice to provide um, the services for the for that uh, for their patients. Um, our health and social care board is met regularly um, with GP representatives, actually to encourage and uh, GP practices to contract for services uh, where uptake is lower than some of the other areas. So that would actually support uh, fill those gaps. Uh, and as I said, in regards to multidisciplinary teams. Um, we have those running, uh, and then again, unfortunately, under transformation funding um, as well. So that you know, the more surety I could have in funding, the more multidisciplinary teams we could actually uh, open out there as well. Uh, I'll take up your point that they're not mentioned in, in multidisciplinary or, or mental health strategy. Um, not something that had come to to my notice to the Jerry, but certainly something I'll follow up on. Uh, thanks, Minister. Uh, I appreciate that. And, and uh, with respect, uh, I think um, the reply or the answer that there's money there and they can apply for it uh, isn't really addressing the fact that there's such a discrepancy. You know, some areas across the north, some constituencies, uh, 100% of GPs, uh, I think it's East Antrim, um, have these services. And, and that's great for people, obviously, in East Antrim. But uh, in West Belfast and other parts of the north, there, there's a not a not a high uh, uptake uh, in them. So that's very concerning and what needs to be done to address that. Also, I think there's a discrepancy in the amount of um, money being spent on these services. It's several million. million. Uh, I think it's around about three million um, from the HSC board. There's around 10 million per year per annum spent on um, you know drugs for, for treatment uh, of mental health. And obviously that's important for some people in some conditions, but uh, um, there's a concern that there's no over reliance on medication rather than counseling services. But I'll just move on so time is, time is quick. Um, Minister, last week, um, Charlotte McCardle, the Chief Nursing Officer, said only one third of care homes were operating the care partner um, scheme that you obviously announced uh, last year. Um, why is it that a vast majority of care homes are not acting on your own? What action is being considered or being taken to ensure that uh, private care homes um, not only abide by your direction, but also make sure that loved ones can access to their um, their families who are in care homes at this very uh, difficult time and have you considered fines or financial penalties in that uh, consideration? Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks, Jerry. No, and, and again, a point that a point that I I, I, I feel strongly about is about when those changes or those regulations uh, are made that the care homes do move uh, to facilitate the margin from the first of, of this month, as from Monday, uh, because of the change of the alert status due to COVID, we move from level five to level four, which does change uh, visiting um, guidance and, and regulation as well as to what has been done. Um, I, I met with, with Charlotte and a number of our chief officials last night, uh, actually in regards to care home visiting. I was speaking to uh, the Commissioner for Older People as well, as, as well because he, he was right, rightly raising his concerns uh, in this area as well. So, so we do continue to engage with care home providers to see what their difficulties are, because again, we have the guidance is there, the regulation is there, uh, but also the funding and support mechanisms are there as well. To facilitate more visiting as well, you know, we identified care partners as those being able to access the vaccine uh, to facilitate that as well, because it was a concern uh, that some care homeowners actually raised with us that they were, you know, residents have been vaccinated, staff have been vaccinated, but they didn't want to. They were concerned about them letting in care partners, so so we covered those under the cares uh, protocol as well. I think that well, there's over a regional. I think it's over approaching. Uh, 1,200 people have taken up the vaccine as care partners as well. The latest, latest count, uh, I think Sharon indicated last night, was actually in the region of 48% of care homes were now implementing care home status. Uh, one of the concerns that, that we would have and one of the things that uh, openly raised with me that I want to see addressed was that's a, a self-reported mechanism. Um, so we've asked our QIA if there's more they could be doing. Uh, to ensure that those who are saying that they are um, delivering care partner uh, facilities that they actually are, but to those who aren't, that we do look to see uh, what can be done as well. Because of, you know, I, I think we've been clear before, and I think probably maybe even in, in the region as well, if there is legal action needs to be taken, you know, it's unfortunate that anybody would have to go that length. 
but as we move through all the support mechanisms that are there, but also the change in visiting status as well, that should encourage more care homes to do that. And, and Chair, just as, a, as an aside and not to take away, I think one of the things that we should note as well, uh, through our vaccination programme, uh, on the 11th of January, January, we were supporting 150 care homes, uh, which had an outbreak. Yesterday, it was 23. So we can see a direct correlation to the success of, of our vaccination programme, and especially taking that approach in care homes as the initial the initial cohort that we actually indicated and followed up on. Yeah, I think that's that's certainly welcome and encouraging. I had had noticed that uh, that, that 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 was a significant drop there, and I'm sure we're all relieved about that. So, listen, I'm going to Paula then. Uh, Paula, go ahead, please. Um, good morning, Minister and Chief Medical Officer. My first question is in relation to the um, special educational needs teachers. Minister, I, I haven't, as you know, have not at any stage during this vaccination programme tried to prioritise one, pri one profession over the other, and I do believe in the clinical vulnerability and at-risk criteria around that. However, there seems to be delays in terms of the rapid testing in SEN schools, and also there's a high number of SEN teachers who are actually off sick. Marry that then with the their parents, the, the parents of these children, their carers who've been living on their nerves for a year, and then the very rigid test PHA through the community paediatrics are introduced as to which SEN teachers are being vaccinated. Is there no way that you can intervene, Minister, and try to have a blanket approach to SEN teachers? Please, thank you. Um, thanks, Paula. And in regards to the, 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 I suppose the dual approach there in regards to vaccination and also uh, testing as well. Um, well, look, 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 there's not. Uh, I have maintained JCVI status uh, and guidance um, from the beginning as an approach that has been taken uh, across the four nations. Um, but like you, there, there's many, um, there, there's many individuals and many cohorts you could make a special argument for. But there are so many you could make that special argument for. Uh, it starts to prove then difficult to actually provide a vaccination program. That we can. One of the latest updates uh, that came from JCBI was in regards to, and they had been looking at it, but the prioritisation of occupation. Uh, one of their one of their findings, one of their pieces of guidance, is that if you start to prioritise specific work cohorts uh, at, at this stage, that could actually end up slowing down the vaccination programme because we're now looking at the mass supply and the mass accessibility of vaccines. So it's better, and in, in their guidance, that we move quickly through cohorts by age profile, uh, which will hopefully catch up all those all those interest groups and all those special groups that, that need support as well. In regards to the specific testing, Michael, do you want to come in there? Because we are making uh, well, we are making stages in regards to testing, not just in special schools, but also in other schools as well. Okay. Yes, Minister. Thank you, um, and 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 thank you, Paul, for the, for the question. A very important area, as, as you've quite rightly identified. As the minister has indicated, um, we have certainly worked very closely, public health agency, uh, with the educational authority, with the Department of Education, and with local paediatricians to identify those children with particularly complex needs who would benefit from those working with them having the vaccine. And it's all about protecting vulnerable children, as as you've indicated. Uh, that work has been completed. There's a communication, I understand, that will be shortly going out to, to, to special schools. I want to thank everyone who's been uh, involved in that, and I hope that that vaccination programme will get underway in the very near future. In terms of the testing, um, that again has been agreed. Uh, the uh, rollout of that is commencing, is my understanding, or has commenced uh, within five uh, uh, schools at present. With a, a view to rapidly rolling out to the other 39 uh, remaining schools. Um, it's obviously a complex process for both uh, parents, children, and indeed staff. Um, and um, as I say, that will be facilitated through lab tests, uh, which are saliva based tests, so it's less invasive for the children. And I'm grateful to uh, Queen's University, who will be working very closely with PHA and EA in terms of facilitating uh, those test results and getting them to. Uh, to the, t the teachers themselves uh, and also to, to pupils and parents. Um, so that work is well underway, uh, Paula, and is progressing. 
Um, thank you. Um, the second question is in relation to post viral conditions, obviously long COVID being one of them, but another being ME. And Minister, you will recall from your former colleague, Joanne Dobson, how long she was campaigning for a, a medical clinical lead in this re regard for the 7,000 ME patients in Northern Ireland. That has obviously um, collapsed in terms of how the Health and Social Care Board has taken that forward. And there's the potential that ME could be brought in with long COVID in terms of assessment and diagnostics. There is a concern amongst those 7,000 um, patients, Minister, that they will actually be sidelined and they're feeling very aggrieved that after is it maybe near, nearly nine years since Dr Henry um, moved out of that post that they have not had a dedicated service. And I'm just wondering how you're going, now that there's more of an attention and a focus on post-viral conditions, how you're going to support the 7,000 patients here in Northern Ireland. Thank you. Um, thank you, Paul, and I, I thank you know, for, for the recognition. It was one of those campaigns that Joanne was was very passionate about, led on, on very strongly as well, and we remember as well. In, in regards to, I, I suppose, the, the support of those, those seven people uh, that, that do need uh, that additional support in regards to the additional provisions uh, that we're looking to, to put in place in regards to, to long COVID as well. I should be looking to see where there is the crossover. Um, of supports that may put be, may be uh, beneficial to both cohorts as well, but in specific in regards to, to the ME provision, and while it has been a difficulty, I think as you say, it's been nine years since that post um, actually has been filled, and it's a piece a piece of work that is still being looked at. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, a positive update or, or any update um, that I can give you at the minute. It's not something I was I was prepared for, but I'll get back to you if you're content with that. Uh, Chair, if that's okay, I'll give an update to the committee and answer to that, that specific question. Can I just uh, one a very quick question, or maybe just to put on your radar, Minister? And it, it's off the back of what Colin was talking there about the regional fertility centre. Um, accompanied and um, uh, associated with that is the fact that the my understanding is that the endometriosis consultant left his post a year ago and hasn't been filled. Some of the women on the call last night and um, constituents I've dealt with um, are in a really, really bad way with endometriosis. Their surgery was delayed a year ago and now when they've gone back they've realised that they have organs that are fused with the, these adhesions and the surgery and other treatment is incredibly invasive now, if not impossible. Can you please look into this gap in a consultant in endometriosis because it is so um, important that we get that post filled. Thank you. No, um, Paul, again, thanks for, for flagging it. Michael, is there anything specific you have there on on that post? Or? Uh, no, uh, nothing I can add, uh, Minister, although I do appreciate um, all of the pain and distress by often a very debilitating condition, which is often there's often a significant delay in the diagnosis in the first instance. Given the nature of the presentation and the symptomatology, uh, and has very profound implications uh, in terms of the long term sequelae of that, as you've indicated, both in terms of fertility, pain, etc., uh, and requires a, a very complex multidisciplinary approach, both surgical and, and support. Uh, so, very happy to, to get back to you uh, on, the, on the detail of how that's been progressed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Paula. And going then to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron. Pam, go ahead, please. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thank you, Minister and Chief Medical Officer, for your attendance at committee today. Um, I wanted to kick off with um, just something that uh, the Deputy First Minister mentioned yesterday in the statement to the House around the, um, the pathway to move out of these restrictions. And she referred to um here being much much worse um that's not a direct quote than than everywhere else i think she meant in uk and possibly republic Ireland. so could you give us uh, an update of the infection rates and the the comparisons with um each part of the uk and also the republic of ireland um that's my first question thank you okay um Thanks, Paul. I, I don't have slides to date. Michael, do you have the updated slide that we presented yesterday in regards to infection rate? I, I do know I don't have exact figures, um, Pam, but I do know that we were um, somewhere at level with Scotland. We were lower than the Republic of Ireland and England, but higher than Wales. Not sorry, just off, off the top of my head, I'll ask the chief medical officer. Maybe if we're not. 
Uh, yes, I don't have the, the exact uh, slide details in front of me, but uh, as the as you will um, as you recall, that what we've been saying over the last couple of weeks that the relative uh, test positivity rate, if we look at the uh, seven-day cumulative total cases per hundred thousands, as published by the respective countries, over the last number of weeks that has changed, and the differences between uh, the the five nations um, has narrowed. Uh, so at, at various time points, we went back a significant number uh, of, of of weeks. We had the, Re the Republic of Ireland was at a very high level compared to the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, as a result of the measures taken there, that fell very rapidly. Um, and um, over the last few weeks, uh, Northern Ireland uh, was seen at a completely higher level than Scotland uh, and Wales. That gap has narrowed in the last week. Um, and the data that I uh, produced, or sorry, shared yesterday publicly as published information uh, demonstrates that the gap uh, between Northern Ireland uh, and Scotland has narrowed. Uh, the uh, prevalence is higher in Scotland, sorry, is higher here than in Scotland and higher than in Wales, uh, is now below the Republic of Ireland uh, and again uh, below um, uh, England. But as I say, that is a, it's a very uh, you know, a fluid position, and if I look back at the figures last week, it would have been it would have been different again. There are other ways of obviously estimating that, and one of the other important studies is the Office of National Statistics Infection Survey, which demonstrates that um, just to summarise it in the interest of time, that about one in 104 people in England have been estimated as uh, have been infected with COVID, uh, one in 195 uh, in in Northern Ireland one in uh, 225 in Wales, so again lower, uh, and one in 205 uh, in uh, in Scotland, lower again. So uh, we do, uh, at least on the, uh, looking at those two different measures, uh, the estimated prevalence here is higher uh, than it is in Scotland and Wales, confirming the published data in terms of those testing positive, uh, and at present uh, is lower uh, than England. <laughs> Can I, can I just can I just come in there? Sorry, there's a bit of background noise bleeding into the conversation. Can I just ask everyone who's not speaking to ensure that they're on mute, please? Okay, and I'll go back to Pam then. So for clarity there, and I thank you for that um, detail. So for clarity, um, do you agree with the, the Deputy First Minister's assessment yesterday that the infection rates were, are much, much worse here than the rest of the UK and, and Republic of Ireland? I, I didn't hear the uh, Deputy First Minister's comments yesterday and I didn't hear the context of what she said or in, was, it in response, was it in a statement or response to a question. So, I, you know, again, I, I don't want to be drawn into commenting on that in that I'm, I, as I say, I don't know the context and I didn't hear what was actually said. Um, it's, not a, it's not a description of our infection rates that I would use. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on to vaccination, and I do very much welcome um, that the move to over 50s uh, will be vaccinated come April. And I also understand the calls from other professions, such as um, police in particular, um, given what they face in, in dealing with um, placing restrictions, for instance, and also for that, that, that the call for priority for teachers. I understand that. I don't necessarily agree with prioritisation in terms of professions myself either. Um, but I think the ultimate solution to this is still to get everybody vaccinated as quickly as humanly possible. And that leads me back to my previous calls for uh, a 24 seven rollout and understand supplies will be coming. There should be Hopefully, um, it should be there should be much more supply coming very soon. And would you consider, Minister, um, a rollout or even um, uh, piloting even at small section time, even a week or a weekend, a trial even of twenty four seven rollout to see how that would you know if those slots if people would actually um, be willing to come in overnight and, and, and in the early hours in the morning to actually have their vaccination done because I, I honestly believe that people are, are, are desperate to, to move on in time and to get past these restrictions and actually the vaccine is the biggest way out of this and the most helpful way 
out of this out of the restrictions and i think really we need to pull out all the stops and ensure that the vaccine is offered to as many people as possible and understand that that is dependent on supply but if you have supplies are you prepared to roll it out 24 7. Um, Pam, I think what we're doing, again, depend, dependent on supplies. Um, I think our, our next step is to make, make, make it as accessible as possible, and that's why we're moving to what has been you know, scaled at our mass vaccination centre, uh, which is going to open the SSE arena, where we hope to be able to do you know, 40,000 people per week. That will still be running alongside our six other regional facilities. That will still be running alongside our GP practices. And then towards the end of this year, also community pharmacy uh, as well. Once we get that uh, bottomed out as to how many of them will be able to do it, where they want to do it, or where they want to centralise some function as well. So I, I think rather than looking at time, it's about location. Uh, to get vaccination as close to people as to where they are as well. In regards to the SSE arena, we are looking to extend it ours. We're not going into 24-7. But it's something definitely when we see uptake, when we see bookings there as well, and how that's progressing based against supply. It's something we, we look at. But uh, as we're going 24 7, I, I don't think we're there. Uh, but maybe running later into the night, as to rather than just you know running from our, our, our 8 to 9 or 8 to 8 that we're doing now, it's, it's something that we'll, we'll keep on the table at all times because, like you, I want to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. Thank you. Okay, th thank you. Thank you, Minister. And going then to Carl. Go ahead, Carl, please. Good morning, Dr. McBride. How are you? Um, so my questions are uh, relating to workforce planning. So we had the CNO and the Deputy CNO in front of the committee last week. Um, I just want to say to you, um, I found it a bit shocking that there's almost a relaxed position in terms of the safe staff legislation not coming through. And I am concerned regarding the horrendous year that our health and social care staff have been through that we need to see, in my opinion, an intervention to look after them a bit more with legislation. The other question I have is um, in relation to the red flag surgery. So in Belfast pre-COVID, you were looking at approximately 900 surgeries a week. At the minute, I think it's been stepped up to maybe around 200, which is welcome. So given the fact that Belfast or yeah, Belfast City Hospital will become a regional centre, what is the average a week? And the other aspect is you said that um, COVID patients will be moved to the matter. Does that include ICU facilities? Um, I think we need clarification on that. The last thing I want to say is I would appreciate some feedback to the rest of the committee um, regarding the workforce planning issue. Uh, it's been with us for some time, but particularly now, uh, we've all paid tribute to our health and social care staff, and, we, and we're all sincere in that. But I think we need to step in, frankly, and uh, look after them a bit better than what we are. And I think the absence of safe, half safe legislation um, is quite uh, disappointing, to put it mightily. Um, thanks, Carl. In regards to, to supporting our staff, I, I don't think you'll find a stronger advocate than, than myself since we come in. Uh, to this position, you know, our, our staff were on strike uh, when I came into this post, uh, and it was on pay regards, and it wasn't safe staffing as well. There has been a bill team established to bring about that legislation, and it's now engaging with our, our trade union side as well as to what that what that actually looks like. Uh, we want to get it right uh, rather than rush it, because I, I like you, I think we need to bring uh, that into place. But it's the time we're running you know, with a year left in, in this mandate as well. We've looked at the Scottish model, we're looking at the Welsh model uh, to see what, what best suits, what can be done. Uh, can we bring in a framework earlier that isn't legislation based that can actually see those provisions as well? So I, I don't think there's a relaxed position from our chief nursing officer. I think it'd be quite the well, sorry, it's definitely not a relaxed position when she's talking to me. Shall, shall we put it that way? Because Charlotte is very passionate uh, about, about her workforce as well. 
but it's also looking at the differential between uh, other legislations and other jurisdictions as well, where I won't see if staffing to be about all their staff, uh, and I know other regions you know, have specifically focused in, uh, on our nursing staff as well, very important cohort, but I would rather that this provides that holistic approach uh, for all our staff across our health and social care system. For too long, they've been forgotten, or for too long, they've been allowed to be uh, the area that, that took the hit of the cuts from the matter whose budget it was, you know, it was our staff. That's why we had to put in those provisions of an extra 300 training places for three years to bring our nursing provision back up to, to the standard where where it should be as well. So the but building Minister, Minister, you're gonna you're asking for almost three hundred million. And that's three hundred million to look after agency staff which are which are needed. What I'm yeah. saying is we are going to be on this trajectory unless you grip this the workforce planning issue properly. And Carl, I, I can only do that's, that but that's not happening. Carl, I, I can only do that with recurrent funding, as you know. You know, and the recurrent funding that I got was for safe staff. The only recurrent funding I have in place at this moment in time is the fifty-two million pound for the change in uh, salaries for agenda for change. Now, the commitment that I have, and it was the commitment that was given from the executive, was additional three hundred training places for nurses over three years. That only fills the gap. You know, to, to grip this, and as you say, and you rightly acknowledge, we need those agency staff now because there is such a, a large shortfall uh, in our recruitment processes. Now, it has increased, or our, our vacancy rate has decreased dramatically since 2017, but it's still staggering. It's still well, far too large. We're, we're 3,000 staff short. Yeah. So we're 3,000 staff short. You're hunting 90 million back. I'm so, not, Carl. Sorry, uh, Carl. Sorry, sorry Carl. I'm, I'm, I'm not now. No, sorry, Carl. If we go back round round that that cycle, now it was a one-year budget. It was COVID relief monies that I got towards the end of the year. Uh, I then was able to reallocate, or actually get back to Connor and ask for another 150 million for PPE. So not only well, you know, I, I may have handed 90 million pound back on paper, but then I went and asked for another 150. So I'm actually 60 million on the other side of, of that ask because of what we were able to do with. With PPE as well. So if I could re if I could reallocate that single you know, those money that we got towards the end of the year and put more nurses on the ground there on then, I would have Carl. It's not something we can physically do because it takes time to train those staff. And in the meantime, what happens to the staff who are beleaguered, exhausted, emotional, feel unappreciated, undervalued because they're on twenty three grand a year? Seriously, like. Uh, no, though, and, and Carl, those, those are the pay rates that we, we inherited. Uh, and as you do remember, one of the things the executive did collectively was me led the negotiations uh, with our trade union side in regards to getting that pay settlement, that parity with, with England uh, restored to get those pay, pay rates back up again. Uh, and I'll continue to do that because I value the staff that we have in the service, and I think we all do. Um, and I, I've said this before, I think we undervalued them for so long because people only seen them as being there when they needed them personally. We now see them as a country, as an executive, as an assembly, uh, as to what they actually do, what they actually deliver as well. So let's make sure we get that, that investment. But it has to be long-term, sustained investment to allow us to make the changes that we need to make. Okay, just 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 let me interrupt there. And um, there is definitely someone's phone coming through. There's there's, a, there's like a tone coming through. Can I ask everyone that's in the meeting to again check that you're on mute at this present time, uh, unless you're unless you're speaking. Okay. Um, okay, Charles, you've very short very short piece of time there. If you if you have anything further. Yeah. The, the in terms of the matter and the ICU. And uh, matter been used for COVID. Could 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 get some because there's like Michael, you'll appreciate this. I'm in North Belfast, and the rumor mill is running rife. So I, for, even if it's bad news, I just want some clarity, please. Michael, do you want to? Yeah, um, my understanding, and um, is that obviously the priority here has to get uh, complex uh, surgery regionally and. Uh, Sorry, Carol, I'm not sure. Are you picking me up okay? Yeah. Sorry, I missed you at the start, Michael. Sorry. 
as uh, we discussed earlier, the priority must be to re-establish regional complex surgery, and clearly a lot of that surgery is carried out in the uh, Belfast City Hospital site, which is currently the Nightingale uh, Escalated Critical Care uh, Facility. So the priority must be uh, to de-escalate the MCU in the Nightingale facility to to then use the regional prioritization of surgery. So we maximize uh, the, the individuals who are, as we discussed earlier, still waiting uh, for their, their surgery, red flag surgery. Uh, that will then mean um, for those patients who require uh, COVID. So in other words, creating green sites again, green pathways uh, in the city hospital and, and the other sites that will again then mean that we'll have to manage COVID patients requiring complex respiratory care or ICU on other sites. Uh, and in the past, that was uh, in the Belfast Trust area, uh, the Matter Hospital, and I, I, the plan will be to uh, support those patients uh, in, on the Matter site, is my understanding, um, in, in the short term. And hopefully, as we suppress community transmission of this further, and as we said earlier with the rollout of the vaccine, uh, the pressures related to COVID uh, will become less, uh, and then you know, we will continue to keep the situation in terms of what services are provided where on what site under continuous review. So, sorry, Chair, my final question. So, Michael, yeah. not to miss yeah, you. Yeah, but you're saying that temporarily the ICU will be opened in the matter to deal with COVID and particularly complex respiratory. Does that mean to say those ICU intensivists will stay? After? Yeah, I, I I, I, again, I'm not across the detailed plans, uh, uh, Carol, in terms of the operational arrangements that the Trust is currently uh, considering, because obviously those are very complex arrangements. Uh, and, you know, I think, as we've said already, we want to, I want to put on tribute uh, here. My thanks to all of those staff who've relocated, nursing staff, medical staff, uh, support staff, uh, OTs, physios, um, who are working uh, across sites um, and have relocated uh, to provide care to very sick patients uh, who, are, who are still in our hospitals today and will be for many, many more weeks uh, with COVID. Carl, can I, Jake, uh, uh, sorry, Carl, can I just ask, have you had a meeting or do you want a meeting with the Belfast Trust with that? No, uh, sorry, thanks, uh, Minister. I've organised one. Okay, right. No, that's, I'm that's right. the Belfast yeah. Trust back is fairly quickly, so I just want to put that's that That's all right. No, that's all right. No, I thought that would be useful to you and the facilitated reception. Okay. Thank you. And going then to Orlea Flynn. Go ahead, Orlea, please. Um, thanks, um, Colin, and thank you, Minister and Dr. McBride. So um, I'll just I'll try and be quick. Um, I, I'm glad that Jerry raised the, the GP counselling um, issue, and Cara also earlier in the meeting touched on the issue of addictions. And I suppose just broadly, I am worried when we're talking about the pathway to recovery, which is a positive and which is full of hope. Um, I, I do have um, serious concerns around Minister, and I know the conversations around the budget that obviously you have so many priorities. Um, you know, you have a tight budget that you're working with. But in the context of the, the pathway to recovery and in the context of mental health, um, I do have serious concerns that... Um, we're not going to be in a great place in that respect. Um, and I'll give you some reasons for that. So um, at the minute, the issue with, we know that the, the inpatient beds for addictions, there's none at present. I think we only have 30 right across the north. Um, I learned recently that the RAID service, which is the crisis service in the Belfast Trust, that the money has stopped for that. Um, we know that new patients in relation to mental health are being seen later and they're presenting with much more acute needs. Um, we know that known patients um, are now also presenting with greater needs and the number of people detained under the mental health order is now three times that amount um, from the pre-COVID-19 levels. So with all that, and, and I do appreciate that I know that the fourth meeting took place with the Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Executive Subgroup yesterday, which is great. Um, the 6.5 million was announced for the, the emotional health and wellbeing framework, which is great. But Minister, I suppose what I'm really looking um, to, to ask yourself today is, can you commit to, in your future budgets, as tight as they are, can you commit to attempt to increase that proportion of the, the share of the funding, that 5 to 6% for mental health services, commit to increase that um, in some shape or form? 
Um, I know that the officials briefed us a couple of weeks ago on, on the budget and I asked the same questions and I know that you have recognised that the mental health services are underfunded and that there is insufficient money. The officials did say that the department is on that journey towards increasing funding and that they will do a sense check. So I just I just want to put that to you today to see if um, I know it is a priority for you and you have you know you have made all the right sort of um, soundings about that and I appreciate that. But when it comes to funding and investment, can you give um, that reassurance today that you will try and increase that percentage funding? Uh, Arlie, I, I, I can give that commitment. I'll try and do that because I, you, I think you know that it is something that I am passionate about. It's something I want to do. I've been consistent. Uh, since coming into this post, and we did that. You know, even during COVID, we kept the work on in regards to the mental health action plan and the mental health strategy. And that's about the 10 year long term investment uh, in our mental health provision in Northern Ireland. We have the opportunity to make uh, this place a world class example in regards to how we support uh, people who have mental health challenges. Uh, and I think that's where we should be aiming for. But as you rightly indicate, my budget is challenging. Uh, what we need to do is complex and is across a wide range of sessions. But we've seen over the number of years that, uh, again, like you know, Carl Ray's staffing, mental health uh, was at the sharp end of a lot of those cuts uh, in regards to provision to facilities as well. So we've put in additional funding bids in regards to capital and, and additional borrowings as to how we can even improve our facilities as well because our bed capacity uh, for mental health provision is some of the concerns concerns me, especially as we approach every weekend in regards to where we have a spare bed and spare bed provision as well. But it also comes down to the challenge that we have in staffing uh, because of you know the gaps that we have in, in our staffing provision, especially in the mental health services as well. So th this is about a long-term commitment, a long-term journey, and I think that's what our, our 10 years plan does. Uh, and it's something that we have to focus on. It's something that you know, and I, I, I welcome the executives committee you mentioned during the meeting of the subgroup yesterday. I, again, or or fourth meeting, but I, I don't mean this to be negative or derogatory earlier, but one of the most engaging, thorough, thoroughly thought through con contributions that I feel all our ministers give. Because around the executive table, our ministers, all of them, uh, get the need to do this. And, and do it right. And it's not just investing in our mental health services as well. It's about how each of the departments contribute. It's about when it comes to addiction services, it's about how we tackle that uh, supply at resource. You know, it's about how the paramilitary task force then has a role to play in actually supporting addiction services because of the supply. And the illegal supply is not there. Uh, you challenge that as how DERA and directs by making sure you have wide open spaces. It's infrastructure and communities working together and you know, on some of our you know interlink or our, our bridges projects you know, across the West Link and the M2, which all contribute not just to the mental health and well being um, of the people in those areas as well, but also as an investment about that early prevention that people feel better. We do a lot of the preventative work and that's what that's what the investment ought to be about. Unfortunately now we have to invest and the people who weren't invested in uh, a number of years ago, and that's about how we support them. I'm making sure, and you know, when I had uh, Siobhan and Neil, mental health champion, uh, was at the, the briefing yesterday with Michael and myself. And the clear message is if you need help, ask. You know, and it goes back to that phrase, you know, it's good to talk, it's good to ask. If you need help, you know, please, there is somebody there, there is Lifeline, there are GPs, there are, there are other counseling services out there that can provide. A lesson in the air, if not for people need, but they can also provide a signpost for those who need need, need to know where to go. Okay, thank thank you. And then I'm um, going Alan, Alan Chambers. Go, Alan, for a question, please. Minister, earlier this week, the Assembly received an Executive Office statement on a roadmap back to post-COVID normality, delivered by the Deputy First Minister in the presence of the First Minister. So it's not unreasonable to assume that this statement represented a corporate and collective agreed executive position. The central uh, theme, uh, theme still seem to be that we are all in this together. Uh, disappointingly, some of the comments and the questions uh, during that debate appeared to represent 
a few members of parties in the executive taken a position of perhaps not been happy with the collective position and subsequent remarks in the media further confirmed that some elected reps are not happy with the democratically collective decision making process. Does this make the public health messaging more difficult? Um, second question would be in relation to calls for uh, roadmap dates to be published. Uh, it's, I know it's hugely disappointing to be given a date and then find it been pushed back. And it, it is not as though the various uh, variants are, are sharing their future plans with us. So can you confirm that the roadmap as published will be subject to constant review and the stages of recovery will not be delayed one day longer than necessary? And my third comment in, is in relation to um, a, a comments that uh, Carl made that uh, highlighting uh, the, the staff pressures at the moment. Could the minister remind me what party held the health portfolio uh, before he took it over just over a year ago with a pandemic coming down the line, Adam? Thank you. Um, I think, thanks, all. And in regards to in regards to dates, um, there are the four four set review periods, uh, and four dates are actually contained in the plan. Uh, they tie in with the, the executive, the agreed executive position that we will review our regulations every four weeks. It's something we've agreed to do. It's something that is actually in our regulations that they are formally reviewed every four weeks. But we've also made clear as well that if there is the opportunity to review or look at something. Uh, in between times, we will do that as well. But I think we're, we're on record, the executive is on record as saying that we will only keep these restrictions in place as, as long as is necessary and that they are proportionate after where we see uh, the spread of the virus uh, itself. In regards to who was in this position before, I, nobody was all in the three years without uh, a minister. Um, so I, I, I come into to, to an MD office, I think that's well, well documented. But in regards to public health messaging, uh, and again, it's something that, that I, I, I've often said, um, we need uh, the support of the general public. Uh, we need the general public working with us while we get through uh, these next weeks and months, uh, because that's where the opportunity and the hope actually is, is how we get in and how we get through these next weeks and months with the restrictions that we have in place, but also the opportunity that the vaccine brings. The vaccine will not do all the heavy lifting for us. It's not the, it's not the panacea uh, for, for, for everything. So it's the mixture of people following the guidance, following the restrictions uh, that we have in place, plus the benefit that the vaccine brings. So the message, the message from, from me, the message from the health department clearly has always been is to follow the, follow the guidance, follow, follow the regulations that are there, Take the vaccine when you can get it. The simple messages still apply. Uh, social distancing, good hand hygiene, good respiratory hygiene. But one thing that we are clear of, and one thing that I am clear of, is when everyone is given the same message, everybody hears the same message. And that's when we get the response uh, from the people of Northern Ireland. And I will say, um, Alan, I will say, Chair, I'm thankful for the members of this committee uh, for the support that they have given uh, to my department to the health service and to that public health messaging because it has been consistent because this committee has having sat and heard some of the testimonies some of the evidence stations uh, are well aware of the effect that this virus is having not just on our health service but having on our community um, so i think that is why there has been a consistent approach and message from from the members of this committee and i thank you for that Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Minister and Chief Medical Officer, for your attendance today and for addressing members' questions on your presentation. Um, and also just to, to reiterate our support for the public health messaging and to ask everyone to do all they continue to do all they can to keep themselves, their families, their community safe. And I do note uh, the, the, the badge there that Michael is wearing in relation to the safe distancing and the social distancing. Um, so listen, there's just actually, in terms of the data minister, and I, and I know we are all very acutely aware that the data is going to be very important moving forward, and you've touched on it there yourself in the earlier part of the meeting, and, and particularly around the whole critical care and, and that element of things. 
So given that it's going to be so important, could I ask for some specific information to be forwarded on to the committee? So could you commit to sending us on all the minutes and associated papers since August 2020 of the critical care hub meetings? Also, the respiratory hub meetings and the oxygen supply meetings. Those are obviously three key areas in terms of moving forward. Uh, I'll, I'll take that into consideration, Chair. I'm not giving the commitment until. Yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't, yeah, I, don't, I, don't I don't. expect you to have to have that information to hand. That's why. That's why I have to just so. So just ask, ask the critical care hub, the respiratory hub, and the oxygen supply meetings. Yeah, I'll take it into so, consideration to see if they can be shared. Chair. Um. Thank you again, and and good luck in the time ahead. Obviously, we're moving into territory now that is that is difficult because we do need to negotiate and navigate our way out of this uh, this lockdown in a way that's safe and sustainable. And um, just to wish you and all of your team and all of your frontline staff who are out there still battling, still working harder than many of us will ever understand, perhaps. Um, in difficult in, in circumstances that many of us will never experience, I hope, and never fully understand either. But uh, thank you again. Okay. Okay, members. Um, thank you for that. I will take a very short break there, members, maybe just until we get the, the next session lined up. So could we come back again at 11.05 there, members, please, to resume in public session? So uh, if we could just close broadcasting and resume at 11.05, members. Thank you. That's us live now, Chair. Okay, thank you, and uh, thank you, members. We we return to a meeting now, and we will go back to uh, the the opening items of business, uh, we, which we had moved to facilitate the minister's time frame. So we're going um, first of all then to chairperson's business. Um, I just do want to note in terms of of our. Chairperson's business today. A number of us attended last week's uh, all-party group on learning disability, and I think there's a particular call out this week uh, for people who are experiencing or caring for for uh, people with learning disabilities to take particular note of the census and to um, engage with that as fully as possible because it's it's crucially important that there's an awareness and a measurement of what services are going to be needed in the time ahead. We're acutely aware that many of those services have been badly interrupted as a result of COVID, but that they weren't great in many cases even pre-COVID. So I just would I just would reiterate that that public call to ask people to uh, there there are questions added to the census to try to get some more information on that, and I think that'll be something. Um, useful for us for us to do. Um, there were also a number of us who met with um, a number of us who met with a uh, fairness and fertility as well, and I think that's an issue that the minister has acknowledged that is is of is of concern, but that we we should be um, we should be very uh, focused on given the time constraints around that issue. So, just for any other members at, at any of those meetings who want to make a comment in relation to any of those issues, chair, yeah, go ahead. Um, ahead, like the chair, um, I thought the meeting unfortunately didn't last as long as we all would have wanted last night because I think there's a few members who didn't get an opportunity to speak. So I do think that this is maybe an issue as we've started to do as a health committee is maybe just try to have an informal sort of uh, meeting with Fairness and Fertility and other campaigners, maybe some lunchtime to get a fuller picture of the whole issues affecting the Regional Fertility Centre and the services. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I'm sure members would agree that would be that would be a, an issue of some importance as well. Okay, members, um, moving on then to the draft minutes there at uh, of the this is from the meeting of the 25th of February, which are tab 3.1 of your pack. Are members content with those minutes? Content. Yeah, content. Thank you, members. And there are no matters. There are no matters arising from that. Just before we go into the departmental briefing then on health and social care, um, if I could ask Clerk there, I, I did raise an issue at the end that I have uh, was seeking some information, specific information in relation to a number of uh, a number of work streams that I think is go are going to be key in terms of data in the time ahead. I can send you the, the details of those, but it was it was um, the critical care meetings the. The critical care unit meetings, critical care hub, the respiratory hub, and the oxygen supply meetings, and uh, we're looking for the minutes and associated papers since August 2020 on those members. Thank you. 
Okay, so moving on members then to our second briefing this morning, which is a departmental briefing on the health and social care bill. Um, this is a briefing from department officials on the principles of the forthcoming bill uh, in relation to the health and social care board. I refer members to a briefing paper supplied at tab 6.1 of the pack and to a copy of the bill and the explanatory and financial memorandum at tab 6.3 to 6.4. Um, also included in the table pack there at table at tab 6.5 is the Bill's Delegated Powers Memorandum. So I'd very like to welcome to our meeting this morning, first of all, Ms. Martina Moore. Uh, Martina is Director of Organisational Change. Are you able to hear us okay, Martina? I am. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, hearing you there, Martina. You're very welcome, and thank you for joining our meeting this morning. And we also have, I believe, Mr. John Miller. And John is head of the HSCB Closure Project branch. Are you hearing us okay, John? I can hear you, Chair. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm hearing you there. I'm hearing you fine. Thank you. And if I could just uh, remind members of our panel that it is uh, usually clearer if members are using a headset to ensure, ask all members to ensure that they're on mute when they're not when they're not participating in the meeting when they're not speaking, and also to ask panel joining us to ensure that your uh, emails and other devices are muted there on your desk to avoid. Uh, sometimes we can pick up on some of the pinging as emails come into your very busy inboxes. So I would like to then go ahead maybe and invite you, Martina, is it yourself that, that's leading off in the briefing? Go ahead and provide us with your briefing, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, Chair. And I will first like to start off by thanking you for giving us the opportunity to be here today to brief the committee in respect of the Health and Social Care Bill. And as you said, I'm joined by my colleague, John Miller, who's also manager of the bill team. So you're provided, as you said, with a short briefing paper, and which I hope you all have found useful in, in advance of today's pre introductory briefing. So, in terms of the bill itself, the bill is intended to give effect to the closure of the Health and Social Care Board and in doing so enable the transfer of responsibility of its functions to the department and the transfer of its staff to the business services organization, to the ESO. Sorry, the Martina, 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 sorry for, sorry for cutting across yeah. you. It's a little bit, it's a little bit, your sound is not brilliant, Martina. We're, we're catching it, we're, we're following you okay, but maybe if you could just slow down a little, um, it's a little, there's a wee bit of interruption. If you have a headset, that'll be great, but even if you just, uh, if you just, be conscious that there's a wee interruption on the on the line. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'll just. I'll, do you want me to recap just on that first thing? Would that be please, helpful? Please do. Yeah. Yeah. Please do. Okay. So the bill is intended to give effect to the closure of the Health and Social Care Board, and in doing so, enable the transfer of responsibility for its functions to the department and the transfer of its staff to the Business Services Organisation, the BSO. The bill has seven clauses in total. And in dealing with the dissolution of the organisation is quite technical in its nature. So before handing over to John, who will give information on the bill itself, I thought, if, if, it may, if you may, it will be useful to recap on the decision to close, the subsequent consultation and the operating model to be introduced in closure. Um, as you'll all be aware, the decision to close the Health and Social Care Board was taken back in 2015. Um, and that was a decision that was first announced by the former Minister Hamilton. And that followed the review of commissioning, which had been conducted in response to the Donaldson report. That review, which amongst other issues, found the current system to be overly complex and bureaucratic and lacking clarity of decision making and accountability. So that decision to close was subject to a public consultation, and it ran for an eight week period from December 2015 through to February 2016. We received 181 responses in total to that, and they were from a wide range of stakeholders. And that included MLAs, voluntary and community sector, professional bodies, the independent sector, and trade unions. And an assessment of those responses gave a clear endorsement of the need for change. And whilst it was acknowledged that change in structures would not be a cure all for the issues facing our health and social care sector, as part of a broader strategy for transformation, having more effective structures will allow us to better focus our resources and support the system to operate more effectively. Following that consultation, then the decision to close was confirmed when it was also announced by the then Minister that on closure, responsibility for strategic decision making would transfer to the department. And that decision was reaffirmed later that year with the publication of Delivering Together, which is, you know, is our 10-year roadmap for transformation, brought forward by Minister O'Neill as the then Health Minister. 
and actually featured as one of the 18 initial key actions, and that was action nine, and that's the need to develop the design of new structures and approaches to support the reform of planning and administration. So if we move forward now to the beginning of last year, Minister Swan endorsed the decision to close the board as the policy position has re remained consistent. In terms of that interface area, work was progressed both in relation to the development of the required primary legislation, which as you know is needed to give effect to the closure, but also on the new operating model to be introduced. So if I turn just to the operating model, in line with the previously announced intent, that the bill enables transfer of responsibility for the functions of the board and the strategic decision making to the department. And as I said earlier, the staff will then move to the BSO. So that new model will actually see the staff of the board continue to undertake its current functions, albeit they'll be under the direction of the department. They'll be employed by the BSO, but they'll be led by a senior civil servant at a grade three. And under this model, staff retain their HSC terms and conditions through their employment by BSO, and no staff will be made redundant. And if we go back, I suppose, to that initial decision, it's always been clear that this is about structures and not people. So the board has very many talented people working in it, doing important things. And this approach, while streamlining the structures and reducing the bureaucracy, will provide for continuity of service and thus minimising the risk of delivery to the overall system. And we've established staff side forum to facilitate our trade union engagement and consultation on this change programme. And that engagement has been of the utmost importance in this process, particularly given the time frame we've been operating in since that initial decision. In terms of the development of the model, we have a project infrastructure in place, and that's bringing across staff from across the department, the board, BSO, and actually the PHA. And they work together now to progress those activities that will be required to enable the implementation of the model, but also to facilitate improved ways of working and trade union representations embedded within that process. And this collaborative approach really promotes that one system ethos that we're seeking to embody across health and social care. So I suppose moving to timelines then, subject to legislative provision, we seek to introduce the model from the 1st of April 2022. We anticipate a closure date of the board is 31 March 2022. And as you can imagine, these dates have been chosen specifically to mitigate against a number of potential risks. And that's the complications that you would associate with a closure part way through a financial year and the double running of systems and the double, double accounting requirements. So the proposed closure date would minimise any potential issues with governance and accountability. So just before I hand over to John, I'm going to actually give you some more detail on the bill itself. I suppose we just want to reiterate an earlier point. And that's really the closure of the board will not solve the issues facing our health and social care system, but it's an important step in a wider transformation journey, which will look at how we can plan and manage our services differently. It's going to enable us to streamline our structures and processes and better focus our resources and bring certainty to those staff within the board who've been operating since 2015 in that period of relative uncertainty. So if we may, I'd like to hand over to John who will take you through the bill. Yep, thank you, Martina. Yes, go ahead, John, please. Good morning. Um, as Martina stated previously, the briefing document provided to the committee included detail of the structure of the bill and uh, I would like, therefore, to provide some additional high-level detail of the content of the bill. Um, turning to the construct of the bill, it is worth restating the bill's objectives are simply to facilitate the closure of the Health and Social Care Board and transfer its existing functions to the Department of Health or Health and Social Care Trusts. The bill is quite small in terms of the total number of clauses. There are only seven in total. In terms of the content of each clause and associated schedule, the position is in clause one simply provides for the dissolution of the Health and Social Care Board. A consequence of this is that its committees, including the local commissioning groups, will also be dissolved. Um, it should be uh, reminded, though, that the department's existing statutory duty to secure the commissioning of health and social care services remains in place. Um, in terms of Clause 2, this clause states that Schedule 1, where the majority of the detail is, uh, contains amendments providing for the transfer of the Health and Social Care Board's functions and amendments made as a consequence of the transfer of those functions. Moving to Schedule 1, it references amendments required in respect of 71 individual acts or orders. I'm sure they will all be the subject of discussion during scrutiny, but for now I intend just to discuss only the main changes delivered by the amendments contained within this schedule. The amendments provide for the closure of the Health and Social Care Board 
and as a consequence, the dissolution of its committees. The end of the statutory requirement for the board to prepare and publish a commissioning plan in respect of health and social care for each financial year. As previously stated, the Departments of Health's existing duty to secure the commissioning of health and social care services remains in place. Turning to social care and children functions, responsibility for the exercise of children and social care functions will be placed directly on HSC trusts. These functions are already the responsibility of trusts through delegation from the board. This bill makes transparent who is responsible for the social care and children functions following the board's closure. The Department of Health will have responsibility for oversight of the exercise of those social care and children functions by the trusts following the closure of the board. This oversight will be facilitated by a duty being placed on each trust, having to provide at least annually details of how they exercise all social care and children functions. And these details will be provided in terms of a scheme. The department will have to approve a trust scheme before it, being put, before it can be put into operation. The department may remove a HSE's trust power or duty to exercise social care and children functions and have them exercised, sorry, and have them exercised, um, have them exercised elsewhere. Turning to primary medical services, responsibility for contractual arrangements with and maintenance of providers lists of GPs, dentists, pharmacists, and ophthalmic opticians will transfer to the department. And finally, all other non-social care functions previously delegated by the board to trusts will now be delegated by the department to trusts. Moving to clause three, this clause places a duty on the Department of Health to make one or more schemes for the transfer of all the assets and liabilities of the board to another relevant health body. The assets include the staff of the board and further details included in Schedule 2. Schedule 2 details what the department may do and must do in developing the content of transfer schemes and its interaction with the board staff in that development. A provision is also made within this schedule to provide for co continuity of actions following the closure of the board. For example, anything that was commenced with the board before its closure, including possible legal action in relation to staff or assets and liabilities, becomes the responsibility of the transferee upon closure. That's uh, most likely the department. Uh, moving to clause four, clause four points to the schedule three of the bill, which contains the transitional provisions necessary to mitigate potential risks arising from the closure of the board. And in that schedule three, it provides a duty on the department to produce a final report on accounts on the closure of the board. The final report and accounts are to be shared with the auditor and comptroller general, who is also to provide a final report. The final accounts and report of the board and the Auditor and Comptroller General's report are all to be laid with the Assembly. This schedule also includes a number of general transitional provisions to ensure continuity of provisions within the transfer of functions. Finally, the remaining three clauses deal with interpretation, commencement date and the short title of the Bill. I would now like to turn to the development of the Bill. As I mentioned earlier, the bill is quite short and narrow in scope, dealing specifically with the closure of the board. There are no aspects of the proposed legislation that impact on functions of other departments beyond addressing existing references to the Health and Social Care Board in non-health related acts or orders. During the scoping of the legislation, we identified references to the Health and Social Care Board in 24 acts or orders that fall within the responsibility of other Northern Ireland departments. Amendments in respect of these acts or orders all result in the removal of references to the Health and Social Care Board and substitution of a reference to another relevant health body where appropriate. The respective departments are aware and have agreed the relevant legislative amendments in respect of their own departments and understand those amendments will be progressed through this bill. 
A further number of Westminster Acts have been identified that include references to Health and Social Care Board. Again, amendments will result in the removal of references to the board, references to other relevant health boards, sorry, reference to other relevant health bodies will be substituted where appropriate. Northern Ireland office officials have confirmed they agree that the Secretary of State's consent is not required for this bill. And in addition, they have also agreed to take forward amendments in respect of reserved and accepted matters through order and council should this bill receive royal assent. The Attorney General provided confirmation that the bill is within the legislative competence of the Assembly on the 2nd of February 2021. And that concludes the high level view of the provision of the view of the bill. In terms of our legislative timeline, you'll be aware that a series of legislative steps need to be progressed before the end of this mandate if this bill is to be enacted on the 1st of April 2022. It is hoped that the bill will be introduced in the Assembly on the 8th of March 2021, which is next Monday. Speaker's response regarding this matter is expected this week. Uh, we're happy to take any questions on matters related to the legislation. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you, um, uh, John and Martina. John, just one quick one before I go to a more general one. You said at one point there, I think it was within Clause 3, that it would most likely be the department in relation to one issue. Um, I'm just wondering, is that not clarified yet, or why is it most likely rather than specific? Well, the transfer schemes haven't been... Um developed as yet. Uh, and as Martina said at the start, um, assets and liabilities will be split. and will, The vast majority of assets and liabilities will go to the department. Um, there need to be some work around um, thinking about split in terms of, say, for instance, the example I used was if there was a, a legal case in terms of staff, uh, would, that, would that liability go to BSO or to the department? But those will all be included in the transfer scheme. Okay, thank you. Okay, well then, um, I suppose the, the, the first question me is a substantial question is around the new, uh, how will the new structures improve accountability and decision making? And I did note with some, some concern, just uh, I'd like to tease out, you've mentioned about the children's functions and placing that duty on the trust and that the trust would review annually. Um, and I suppose given this is, a transfer and, and all of the inherent possibilities of disruption within that, given the critical nature of a uh, care for children, is, is an annual review enough to kind of capture if, if something was going wrong? If it, you know what, what would act as, as the canary in the mine quicker than a year down the line, given the vulnerabilities Chair, of Chair, some of the children who may be concerned? Sorry, Chair, if you don't mind, I'll take that one. Um, in, in terms of yes, absolutely, the, John. In terms of the, the functions themselves, uh, the trusts already have responsibility through a delegated uh, a delegation method from the board. Obviously, the board disappears; they can't be delegated from the board. Uh, the decision was made to make this much more transparent and place those responsibilities uh, directly through primary legislation uh, with the board. Um, in terms of uh, the other matters you, you've alluded to there. Performance management will be with the department rather than a board, because the board won't be there um, with the new arrangements. So um, the, the department will be, there will be no middleman, if I want to use that phrase, in terms of those performance management issues going forward. So the department will have uh, uh, sight uh, directly on any performance issues. Uh, the schemes, um, uh, uh, or in the legislation is annually. Um, uh, you're probably aware from your, your previous history that um, there is a thing called delegated uh, statutory functions at the moment, and that's a report that comes up through the board, through the department annually. So the schemes are a replacement for those uh, delegated statutory functions mechanisms. Okay, thank you. And then, so that that's the kind of the, the review end of it. Um, in terms of decision making, how how will this how do the new structures how do you envisage the new structures as improving decision making? Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm hearing you there, Martina. Thank you. Yeah, um, in, in, yeah in terms I can of the new hear you, Martina. Yeah. Yeah, in terms of the new structure, what we've outlined then is a model whereby the, the 
staff, which were formerly the, the HSCB, will actually be directed by the department and they're going to be led by a senior civil servant for grade three. We have to give that clear strategic decision from the department and that clear line of decision making and accountability to improve on what the rules of removes bureaucracy layers of administration. That's a clear line up. So there's actually the, the civil servant grade three will be actually completely leading that group. So they will direct that and all decision making will come at the direction of the department. Okay, thank you. And in terms of, an, and you had mentioned, Martina, I think transformation. How how do you think this can assist in terms of pushing forward the transformation agenda? This particular proposed change, how do we not assist with that? Well, this, I suppose this proposed change, it does a number of things. Um, and John alluded to that earlier in his presentation. You know, it actually removes some of the provisions that underpin our current commission services, the likes of the local commission and groups and the the need to develop a commission plan direction. So what we're actually doing now, Chair, is we've commenced a programme of work to look building on what we've done here in terms of you know um reducing bureaucracy and streamlining structures. We've actually commenced a program work to look at how we can plan and manage our services differently. Um, and what we would like to do is if we welcome the opportunity to brief the committee on that separately. But that work is now commenced. Now it's going to look at how we can actually plan in a more integrated way. And it's really about a partnership and a collaborative approach based on local needs. So actually, this is a first step in streamlining instructions, structures for reducing bureaucracy, but it's an important step that's going to help us lead on to the next. And that work has commenced, like I said, and that's really about in its first phase, obviously looking at that um, mechanism for getting local intelligence planning, but local will be at the heart, I suppose, of any new structure, because what we're looking at is something based on the direction of travel that we've set out and delivering together, you know, a move towards collaboration, integration, but very much based on the needs of the local population. And, and thank you, Martina. And, and in relation to that, then, how will the department ensure that there's improved stakeholder involvement in that uh, crucial planning, design, and commissioning of services? How is the department uh, planning to ensure that? The approach, um, Chair, that we're, we're looking at at the minute is, is, like I said, it's based on an integrated care model. And that's really about working in partnership, not just across health, health and social care, but beyond. You know, so it's what's critical in this is working with our partners in the community, local council and all, et cetera. And in terms of an integrated care approach, it's really, really important from the outset to have those partners in that process. So in terms of that project we've established, we are actually now working with the Foundry community and local councils and how we can actually build the model. Engagement's key to okay, that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I think that's something that we would be really, really keen to see promoted, expanded, delivered upon and, and, and done on, a, on an ongoing basis. Um, so thank you for that. OK, I'm going to go to members. So at this point in time, I have indications from Carol, Nikhilin, Paula, Jonathan, Pam Cameron and Jerry Carroll. So I'll start off then with Carol. Go ahead, Carol, please. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Martina and John. I um, appreciate that you're coming in to give almost a technical response to the, the Health and Social Care Bill. But even within that, um, there's you know some of the arrangements that the Chair has outlined I would like further clarification on. So, Martina, you said that a Grade 3 would take responsibility for accountability. Is that the Permanent Secretary? No, that's the grade below that. So that would be Deputy Secretary. Level. Deputy, sorry, Deputy so then, Secretary. Okay, yeah. so yeah. so basically, um, so I can get this right. This is part of the health transformation under Bengoa, which looked at systems and not structures. So the dissolution of the health and social care bill, some of the functions will be transferred to the trusts and some will be transferred to the department. And that a Deputy Department Secretary Will take responsibility for accountability on this. So, where does the minister come in? Where does the minister's intervention come in? This. Well, you know, I suppose it's the department are taking accountability and responsibility for decision making. It's, when I talk about the deputy, uh, she's going to be leading that group. So the way the department structured at the minute, we have a group structure, each is led by a deputy secretary. So, this group of staff will become a group that you know will function, take those functions on behalf of the department. He will lead, and she'll be accountable right through, as you say, the permanent secretary and the minister. So the accountability okay. is that straight line up. There. So in terms of, say, for example, um, you know, like uh, commissioning, tendering, procurement, 
um, wh where does that wh where does that lie with is that with the trust or with the department? Well, the department, in terms of this new group, will have responsibility for the commission of the services. The department still has responsibility for that. I suppose where we would probably benefit in terms of coming back is the work that we have started that I mentioned there. We'll actually look at how we can plan and manage services differently in the future. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I can just about so hear you. Sorry. Sorry. So at the minute, as we transition across, that group, will, that group of the department will continue to commission the services as, as, as needed by the health and social care services. But what I was saying is we all have started a piece of work to look at how we can actually plan and manage services differently as a second step of this. So I think it'd be really useful if we came back as a separate piece to this to give you a brief okay. of where we're going to. In well, terms of that. Be, thank you, Martina. We'll see when you do that. Could you also just put um, on the record some of the clarification that I would need in particular? So say, for example, in relation to, is there going to be a standardised approach to commission and tendering and procurement across each trust to ensure that you know that it's completely transparent and accountable. And then the other issue is I would like to see a structure literally of um, what will be transferred to the department, then we'll go to the trust and then where the lines of accountability will be. Um, because we have known this is coming, but what's been lacking here, in my opinion, has been some of the granular detail. So we're going through the stage of passing this bill. While it is technical, we still don't have the detail of what happens in between. So, yeah, I suppose the, the functions of the board itself, the responsibility for the functions that the board currently undertakes will transfer to the department. So even the responsibility for the social care, what John was talking about, is concerned of authority to deliver onto trust, but the responsibility for the functions of the board and its charity will come across to the departments. We, we, will, we will be responsible for the functions within that. But, uh, yeah, we'll take your other points. And come back on that. And and finally, you did say um, there would be no staff made redundant as a result of this. So, what has the trades, the trades unions, and the allied health professionals said regarding this bill? I appreciate some time ago um, you probably had discussions about that, but I would definitely say um, you know there would be certainly a need to have a more recent reassuring conversation, given the fact that um, we're still three thousand staff shortages. We are looking at um, a COVID recovery plan whenever that does come forward. And given this transformation is happening in parallel to all that, we just need that detail. Yes. In terms of the union, we have we've got quite a robust engagement with them and a pretty good relationship. So we meet them now every two months. And we have that staff side forum where we meet, like I said, every two months with them. But what we've actually done is what, what I mentioned earlier in terms of project infrastructure. So we have a number of work strands that are all looking at how this model will be implemented. You know, that looks things like commissioning social care and children. We've actually got trade union representation embodied, embedded within each of those strands. So it's, it's very, very key to this project and it has been ongoing. Thank you, Martin. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And going then to Paula Bradshaw. Go ahead, Paula. Um, good morning, panel. Thank you very much for coming today. And clearly, we've um, put on an awful lot of work into this bill and the preparation um, uh, reports. Um, so, a caveat that, in the sense that I've always felt very uneasy about this proposal, um, I always would have likened the Health and Social Care Board, for example, to the Education Authority, where you would have that layer um, that would then be the sort of buffer between the department and the actual delivery on the ground, in that instance, of schools, in this instance, the hospitals. Um, so, the, the Health and Social Care Board themselves would be the appointees who would have the expertise and knowledge. Um, to you know, direct the commissioning as with the EA board, and the, the, this whole proposal, um, not to be dramatic, but screams um, RQIA mass resignation for me in the sense that um, they're, they're, the people who are on the board itself are the ones who bring their understanding of how um, these processes work, and I just wonder how you're going to ensure that the Department of Health have the same expertise, knowledge and understanding of how commissioning and how health service works um, so that it's not just very much fed straight down from the top. Thank you. That's my first question. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, I mean, we absolutely, like you said, value the expertise of the staff and the board. And I think that was one of the things about this model, you know, that we are introducing, that they will be, it is a hosted model because that ensures they retain their um, HSE terms and conditions, which was very important to the staff. So obviously we need to retain their expertise um, in this space and also obviously make the best use of their skills. One of the things, like I said, we are doing in terms of our approach is actually working in partnership across the department and the board in terms of this new operating model and how we can improve our approaches and like you said how we can learn from each other going forward and another key part of this will be the fact that we are taking forward that work on a new way of planning services jointly so that's a, a separate project that i'm co-chairing with the head the director of the on the board we're taking it as a joint endeavor and look at how we can do this definitely to make sure as you said that there is that read across and there is that learning from each other yeah, I was talking about the you know the the public appointments that that sort of board as opposed to the board that it just uh, 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 in the sense of the staff. I'm talking about that accountability, that governance board that that are, are appointed for that reason to to give that assurance. But please just take make a note of that. I, I don't want to hog the the conversation today, but I, I am concerned about that issue. The second issue is in relation to BSO um, and. I know there's an awful lot of people who work extremely hard in there, but my understanding is that the recruitment processes, for example, within that can take seven, eight months, and it almost seems like a big grinding uh, wheel that you know takes forever for things to actually uh, work their way through the system. In what ways will actually the systems and structures within BSO be quickened up? Or will they be given extra resources um, as a result of this change? Um, at, the, at the minute, the way work is going, this is BSO is very much a hosted model. So as you know, BSO currently provides a HR for the board staff. So in, in terms of that respect, their operation, they'll continue to supply that. And it'll just be more of agreement then directly with the department rather than um, with the board. Um, and we are aware, I suppose, of issues in terms of recruitment, as you said, particularly around the length that can sometimes take of that process within, um, not just the BSO, but the board, as like I said, as they, you know, they obviously deliver that. And that's something that uh, we've been looking been that over the over the last while and over the next year in terms of how that process can be quickened up because those are key positions and part of the work we're taking forward at the minute with the board is a program around it and um, really building their capacity and capability ahead of this transition so part of that is identifying where there are those vacancies and making sure that we can move that recruitment process to get them filled but uh, there is a key focus on the process itself as you said it's too long and unwieldy at the minute and we are working with them in terms of actually sort of trying to put in the measures as well to take that up. Okay, thank you. And the last question is in relation to, I think from the, my reading of the papers there, is that the local commissioning groups will be um, done away with. Um, I was actually on the Belfast one as a, when I was a councillor. And, you know, one of, the, one of the benefits from those, as you know, is the ability to respond to the demography of the um, area that they represent and also to put in place like pilot projects, um, you know, like the Falls project in terms of people's um, And I'm just wondering to what degree will we still see that sort of quite small projects that are tested in a particular area, but then with the potential to roll out. How will this model actually facilitate that, or, or, do, or is that being function being taken away with altogether? Thank you. No, yeah, no, absolutely not. You know, the, the local commissioning groups, I suppose, as a construct of the board will disappear, but the concept of that, you said, that local planning and intelligence is absolutely key, and that's part of the work we're taking forward in that separate programme. Um, so what, what we're actually looking at, like I said, there is, is an integrated care approach, but it's very much based on local people, local needs. Um, and that's something that we're working through at the minute. And I think, like I said earlier, it, we can arrange to come and give you a presentation on that work. But absolutely, like you said, those local um, intelligence, those local groups are actually a key construct of the new model that we're looking to develop at the minute. It's based around local needs and partnership. Okay, thank you, very much. Team, um, thank you very much. Best of luck. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Paula, and thank you, Martina. And I'm going then to Jonathan Buckley. Go ahead, Jonathan, please. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Yep, we can hear you, Jonathan. Okay. okay, thank you, and thanks to the team for the presentation. Uh, it is indeed pleasing that this bill has been introduced some years after it was initially introduced by uh, Simon Hamilton as DUP Minister when the initial proposal and consultation uh, went out. So, and, and I, I do welcome that because if implemented effectively, you know, the closure of health and social care boards will allow the department to take firmer strategic control of the health and care system, allowing clear accountability and removing complexity and ensuring decisions are more efficient and responsive. So my line of question is very much on the same lines as the chairs in relation to accountability and responsibility. What structures will there be put in place within the department to manage trust performance, including waiting times as a result of the transfer of commissioning powers from the board to the department? Uh, and can this bolster uh, accountability and better outcomes? Sorry. Did I... Did did you finish the outcome there? I think there was a bit of a delay on my system. Yeah. Pardon? Sorry, I might have picked up. I'm not sure if I picked up right there, Jonathan. In terms of what you were saying about performance management, I mean, yes, you know, the department obviously will be taking that strategic control of decision making, and with that, looking at the enhanced performance management accountability. And actually, that's another key element of that other piece of work that we're taking forward. Um, it's very much about the department setting the outcomes it expects the system to deliver, and then have that enhanced accountability regime put in place to hold the system to account for that. That's a key element of work that we are taking forward at the minute around performance management. Okay, I'm, I'm finding it not hard. Sure to, it sure. might be my side. I'm not sure, but I'm finding it hard to pick Martine up there, and I don't know if you heard my full question. But um, Okay, I'll, I'll move on to another question. Uh, sorry? Sorry? The sound, the sound is, the sound is difficult on your end, Martina. Um, I'm not sure if you have access to a headset, but we're, it's, it's a struggle sometimes just to pick up everything that you're saying. Um, Jonathan, is, is there an element of the question you want to reiterate back to Martina? No, I, I think she covered. It. I was, I was looking to know how it uh, bolstered accountability and better outcomes. I, I think that was the end of my question, which I don't know if Martina heard. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear better now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, absolutely. I suppose what I'm saying is we will obviously have that strategic control, as you mentioned, and we would be looking to bolster performance management. Um, oh, sorry, I'm not sure if Jonathan's speaking, is he, Chair? No, sure no, he's not. He's, he's not. I suppose, I suppose the question is really how will you bolster that, that performance and, and monitor? We are working. And obviously with the, the performance management team within the board now, and a key part of that, like I said, is obviously ensuring that we bolster their capacity and capability to, to deliver within this new regime. One of the things we're also looking at the minute is the setting up outcomes across the system and really looking at how we can enhance that in terms of what the system to deliver. So where we would set the outcomes at a departmental level that we expect the system to, to actually deliver across, but we'll then look at how we can enhance, uh, and that's a piece of work we have ongoing, how we can enhance and develop our performance management to make sure that we're holding the system to account for those. Okay. A, a notable element of the bill will be the transfer of responsibility right. for exercise of social care and children fu uh, functions to the trust uh, from the Department of Health. What work is ongoing to ensure the lines of accountability in these areas are clear from April next year? So that that's work that's ongoing at the minute within each of these strands. So we have a social care and children work strand set up, and that's with staff from across it, like I said, staff from across the department and the board working on that. And they're working through issues like those lines of accountability and the work that needs to be done on both sides to make sure that it performs effectively as we move forward. Okay, and, and how, how will the continuity of service delivery be maintained, particularly with the prospect of, of longer term reform of social care? Um, well, that's the key to that, I suppose, is in making sure, as we said, that we maintain con continuity by making the best use of the people. So, you know, the, pe the people will continue within this. And what we're also looking to do in this space, I suppose, is work with our social care and children colleagues to make sure that, that when there's a need for any recruitment, that that's taken on board and any further development. But we are working across with them to make sure that we can continue that continuity. Continuity is important in all this. What we're also looking to do in this space, I suppose, in terms of any actions we need to take forward, particularly around 
some of the work that I described earlier is that we're doing so in a way that's cognizant of the pressures also with COVID. You know, we're trying to move the tumour and the tree up so we can actually make the transformation, but also be appreciative of the pressures that are on the system. Thank you. It might, it might be my segment. I, I can't pick anything up, but maybe you are. It might Sorry. Be it, it, is, it is it is difficult if you could if you could slow right down sort of uh, almost unusually slow Martina because there is a difficulty with your sound so if you can just keep it really as slow as possible that might help a little. Sure, can I confirm? Are you are you okay. hearing me okay on my side? I'm hearing you, Jonathan. Yes, okay. and um, Martina Martina's sound has been a bit uh, a bit patchy, so there is that there is that issue. Um, have you anything further, you Jonathan? No, ha ha happy to move on, Chair. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm going then to um, Pam. Cameron, go ahead, Pam, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I apologise in advance. I couldn't make out an awful lot. I'm sorry, Martina, we're not really getting you at all between delay and um, bad quality. And it's just very, very difficult to, to make out. So if you've already answered any of these questions, and, and I apologise. Um, so many of the functions governed by the, the Health and Social Care Board relate to achieving safety, quality for patients and service users. For example, the waiting list scrutiny, serious adverse incident reports, complaints, procedures. How will these mechanisms operate after the closure of the board? Could you answer that one first? Thanks. Yeah, it, I suppose it's back to that. We, we would see them as continued job, mainly as they should this minute. Sorry, sorry Martina, 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 I'll, I'll have to cut across you, Martina. Your sound has deteriorated further, and we can't, I'm, I'm not hearing anything of the answer now at all. I'm wondering, is it possible Is it possible for John to answer that question? Um, or is that something that, that it's yourself specifically is aware of? Or I don't know what else we can suggest to improve the sound other than a headset. Um, but certainly, I, I, we weren't able to hear any of that answer to, to Pam. And John, could you? Yes, I, I'll attempt to, to answer that question, and Martina can put in if I'm going in the wrong direction. Um, the, the bill is the bill is uh, entirely about primary legislation, uh, uh, and the the subjects and, and issues um, the the members discussed are largely covered by regulations, uh, guidance, and procedure. In terms of that guidance and procedure, that won't change, and I think Martina uh, they won't won't change immediately. Um, in terms of what Martina said at the start, if I can just re-emphasize, the uh, skills and experience of the uh, board staff uh, won't be lost because they're coming into the department, although they keep their own terms and conditions to be managed by and directed by uh, a grade three director. So in terms of the risk of any kind of loss between uh, the transfer of the function, that's mitigated by those staff coming in with their experience. Uh, and going back on um, a point Jonathan made earlier uh, in terms of social care and children, the, the staff of the social care and children directorate uh, are part of those staff that are coming into the department under the direction of, of the, the grade three senior civil servant, uh, if that helps in any way. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'll go on to my next question. Um, it's stated that the the board staff will retain their their terms and conditions, their their um, health and social care terms and conditions, and that nobody will be made redundant as a result of this bill. That's already been mentioned. Can Can you tell us how the former board staff will be allocated within BSO? I don't know where Martina's picking up. Can I can I ask in terms of clarification of what you mean by allocated? Uh, I I suppose distributed, maybe. The, the staff will be um, directed by the 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 uh, senior civil servant in the Department of Health. Um, they will largely uh, do the same duties and uh, have the same responsibilities as they have now. Uh, the uh, BSO 
uh, will be responsible for the ter uh, terms and conditions of those staff in terms of uh, employment matters, salaries, um, uh, if there were any kind of um, uh, normal employment disputes. But other than that, the BSO won't have responsibility or accountability for the functions that they're delivering. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Pam. And I'm going now to Jerry Carroll. Jerry, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. And uh, I struggled to get some of that as well. Um, so apologies for repeating again. But I think we need just uh, a bit more detail um, on the deployment, uh, redeployment of staff. If we can get that in written form, that would be useful. Uh, and just on the, the question around uh, autonomy uh, and commissioning process, um, I mean, is this... <sighs> Is there scope or, or what's being uh, sought out in terms of um, allowing for a, for a more decentralized system? Because I think there's a concern out there that uh, to use the, the phrase of Martina and John, that you know the, the HSC board was a bureaucratic system um, and there could be a danger of replacing one bureaucratic system with another. So, I mean, what assurances can we get that um, there's going to be the possibility for... Uh, trusts to commission services and they're not going to be heavily reliant or stopped or hampered by um, a centralized system within the department for my question. Um, sorry, it's Martina. Can you hear me? Just about. <laughs> well, I'll try here, hopefully. Thanks, it's a bit better. Uh, what, yeah, so, so what you're explaining is part of this um, separate piece of work that we're taking forward and that's really as i said earlier it's, it's an integrated care approach so that's that, that partnership approach but what it really looks to do is to empower those local and community support providers to plan and manage services based on the needs of their own local population so it's moving towards that position but i think of a, a briefing on that project specifically would be really useful for the committee in terms of that that work has just started but i think it would give you a useful site of where you know the direction of travel is in terms of that Okay, thanks. I got I got most of that. Um, and I suppose what what measures are being considered to kind of avoid specifically a kind of an over centralized approach where the department uh, is able to kind of intervene or prevent or uh, sort of stemmy, if you will, trusts making certain decisions. To what extent is that being considered? I know it's still being looked at, but uh, and what uh, extent is that being considered so far? Thanks. Yeah, I suppose in terms of the, you know, like I said, the new system is very much about um, empowering. So it's, it's really much that more, I suppose, about the department taking a step back, setting the outcomes, expect the system to deliver an in home system to the point. So actually, it's about those giving that autonomy out to that local area to build the system to that point. So that's actually the direction of travel that the new system is working towards. So I think, yeah, like I said, I'm more than happy that we arrange a briefing paper for the committee on that if we wish to see it on that project of work that has started, um, I think that would be really useful because I think you need to see probably then where we're going with that might help you answer some of the questions you have around this. Okay, sorry, thank you. sorry. Yep, thanks. Okay, Jerry, have you anything, anything further, Jerry? Oh, sure, thanks. That's me for now. Thanks. Okay, well, listen, what I would suggest, maybe members, given that that was, given that there was difficulties with the sound there, maybe if members could forward questions that they didn't feel were answered or they didn't hear clearly enough the answer, maybe those could be forwarded through the, to the clerk and the clerk could marshal those and put them in to you, Martina, for a response, just so we pick up, because obviously we want, we want the scrutiny and this even this stage of the scrutiny to be sort of, to have that bit of clarity. So if members are content, um, we, we'll forward maybe some outstanding questions on to yourself, Martina or John. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sure. uh, apologies. Um, yeah, for the sound. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, well, listen, I think that's all the indications we have. I'm not seeing any other hands. I'll just uh, check finally with the clerk before we allow the officials to leave. Uh, clerk, is there any other indications at this point? I've received no further indications, Chair. 
Okay. Okay. Well, listen, I want to thank both uh, Martina and John. Thank you both for your attendance here this morning. And uh, I know this is a, a, a first stage of what will be a specific piece of work that we want, want to drill into in further detail. But for now, I want to thank you for attending our meeting this morning and to wish you all the best in the time ahead. Where am I out of? Okay. Okay, members, thank you. Um, so, members, any, uh, any additional comments that, that members want to raise or anything, anything else that occurs to members who want to discuss prior to moving on? No, I'm not seeing any. I'm not seeing any indications there. Although the only person that will I'm seeing Jerry and Pam on my screen at the present time. Sorry, Chair. Paula yeah, here. Paula. Yes. Paula, yeah, go ahead, Paula. And I see Cheryl. So go ahead, Paula, first. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, I agree with the sound quality wasn't great. I'm just wondering, um, this is to the clerk, is there any chance that we could actually get, there was quite a lot of documents there today that are in our committee packs, and it's actually quite difficult to process them in there. Is there any chance we can have those documents sent as PDF attachments in an email so we can properly interrogate them, please? Yes, not a problem. Thank you. Cheryl? Yeah, sure, maybe it's something under AOB. I'm happy to have a look at the questions and send them in. But see for any um, anyone coming from the committee. I mean, I, I think, and this has happened a couple of times, and like I, I'm only new to this committee, but especially when they're coming from the Department of Health, if they're in the building, it's really hard to hear them. So they should, I mean, if they could be asked to wear headsets or something, uh, and, and then this Starleague system, I think, is awful to be honest so yeah you know there, there does there does tend to be particular difficulties within the, within the department of health so we will maybe via the clerk maybe see if there's further improvements i think the heads had at a minimum and maybe if there was a particular room in the building that was more conducive to the sound or whatever i'm not sure but i think there does need to be some uh, some improvement there obviously it's not it's not a uh, it's not uh, good enough that that we're not picking up everything in terms of the detail. The detail will be important here. So we'll see if we can if we can create some improvements on around that that evidence taken. Um, okay, members. Then I'm not seeing any other indications there. So I'm just uh, uh, as outlined. Then it is expected that the bill will be introduced next Monday, and second stage will be then shortly after that. At second stage, I would speak on behalf of the committee on the principles of the bill. If the bill then passes the second stage, it'll be referred then back to the committee. So are members content with that process and broadly content with that? Yeah. Okay, members. Um, I think if uh, I just want to check, Clerk, what is it? Is the official on, uh, uh, available on the line if we should happen to need one in relation to the Healthy Start scheme? And I'll maybe take that item of business and another item or two of business before another break. Yes, sure. The, the, the official is on the line if, if needed. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to go then to uh, I'll deal with that uh, in item seven is SR twenty twenty one forward slash twenty six, and it's the Healthy Start Scheme and Daycare Food Scheme Amendment Regulations twenty twenty one. Um, and just before I yeah before I before I do into the narrative. Clerk, I do have a question myself, so we, we will want we will want the member, I think, for a short period of time anyway, or the official. So members will remember that this item was deferred from last week's meeting as the examiner of statutory rules was in discussion with officials in relation to the rule. The examiner has now reported that the SR is in breach of the 21-day rule, but that she is content with the reason for that breach, and she has no other issues to raise. The SR is subject to negative resolution. Can I remind members that this SOR makes amendments to provide for the digitization of the Healthy Start scheme and expand the, de the definition of Healthy Start food to include pulses and canned fruits and vegetables. The committee considered the policy proposal for this SOR at its meeting on the 20th of February 2020 and agreed that it was content with the proposed rule. The department has confirmed that there have been no changes to the policy content of the rule since it was considered by the committee at SL1 stage. So um, we do have Mr. John O'Hagan from the Health Improvement Policy Branch within the Department of Health. And if I could just ask if John can be brought up into the spotlight, please.
Sure, I think um, John's joining us on audio only. So it is, so we should be there, okay? Okay. Yes, okay, are you hearing me okay, here. John? <laughs> yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, thank you, John. John, I suppose the, the, the first question I would have in relation to this is around the, the process of access to digital, first of all. Uh, I represent a rural community, as many of our, our committee do, and indeed many MLAs do. A rural community here uh, w with particular issues with broadband. It's Fermanagh and Oma Council is, is recognised as the single worst with Mid Ulster following in terms of access to broadband. I'm also acutely aware, in terms of my, my constituency office, of the significant difficulties that people have at times in accessing universal credits, in having to be there to make a call and the support that is sometimes needed for them, either in terms of technology, in terms of um, access to internet services and all of that. So is it the case that there will be absolutely no option other than digital or can you commit that there will be, were needed, that there will be a, a, a form available for people to apply for this via paper or via uh, some other method where digital may be present particular challenges? I think initially, um, whenever uh, this project uh, was in its, its uh, early stages, um, Colleagues uh, from England who are uh, developing the project um, did um, some testing in Northern Ireland uh, with individuals from various parts of um, the country. And um, the feedback was that. Um, we could or should be able to accommodate the applications online. Um, and that's um, the way that the project is being progressed. Um, there is a reluctance to um, sort of move with, with uh, two uh, application processes. Um, and to move away from uh, the, the the paper application. And how many? How many? You said it was tested. In how many areas and with how many people was that test conducted? Well, it, it, I think in, I think uh, it was initially about twenty people from uh, across various areas of uh, the north. Yeah, and I would suggest I would suggest that that's quite low, and and you know in terms of in terms of rigor and robustness, that wouldn't be a great evidence base. And I can just tell you personally, in, in, in my own experience here, where I live in the country area, I can get a, a reasonable like maybe sometimes below one megabyte or whatever. But uh, the house right next door to me cannot cannot do Zoom meetings as a result. So even even within a very very short area, and that we're both in the same exchange, everything else is equal in that sense. So this yeah. can be very very piecemeal. Is it, is it is it possible that that a review could be built in to ensure that that there is no um, equality issues being kind of uh, that that people who are vulnerable and and may lose out. As a result of this, are not being falling outside of the system. Uh, yes. Well, uh, the the actual application process um, will require less broadband input than the likes of video conferencing, etc. Um, you know, it. it, it if it take no no less a, a broad brand uh, input than you know a plan for car tax or something along those lines, it's, it wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't have the same impact as as the likes of video conferencing, where you would uh, require. Yeah, uh, well, I, under, I understand that. But I, yeah, I understand that. But yeah, I understand that, John. But I I I, I I'm in a, in a constituency here where there are people who literally don't have. Who are still using dial-up and, and things like that. So, 
if if someone yeah. doesn't for whatever reason have access, if someone doesn't have access to online, how are they yeah. going to access the scheme? Yeah, well, I think I think what contingencies you know, what contingencies are in place for those cases? Uh, I think that's something we are going to have to consider uh, as as the the project rolls out, uh, and it's something I can take up with uh, the project uh, people in, in across the water, and and see what what the implications are. I, I imagine that there there are areas um, you know in England and Wales where they would have the same uh, difficulties. So. Um, they are probably looking at contingencies for that. Okay, okay. But Thank I, I, you. So I listen, can, yeah. I can com confirm that with them, and uh, I can com come back to yourselves um, as as the, the the project evolves. Okay, okay. I appreciate that commitment, John, because I think it is an important an important one. We 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 often presume that everyone can access internet somewhere or another, but for a host of reasons, that's not the case. And some of those people may be the most in need of some of these schemes, and the most oh, yes, the most absolutely. the most in need yeah. of support. Yeah, yeah. yeah oh, okay. Thank thank you for that. Thank you for that commitment. I'm going to go then to have a few members indicating here. So I have first of all uh, Jerry Carroll, then Carol McKillen, and then Pam Cameron. So Jerry, go ahead, please. Thanks, Chair. Just following off from your question, I mean, I am quite concerned that hasn't, this hasn't been uh, looked at from, from the answer we got uh, before. I mean, obviously, um, it's quite acute uh, in your area and rural areas, Chair, uh, but also we have a situation in, in urban and in cities and towns where people either don't have access to devices uh, or smartphones uh, and they're unable to uh, get access to um, online um Systems and that obviously was kind of acutely shown through the pandemic around the, the digital gap and that. So I am concerned that this hasn't been looked at, and I think there needs to be you know a scheme in place or assurances, or at the very least work done to make sure that you know people aren't falling through the gaps because this is obviously an important voucher scheme. It's important for the health of uh, you know mothers and children, and the worst thing would be to you know introduce it online and uh, in terms of the digitized process, which may help lots of people. But there could be a, a high percentage of people uh, who could lose out. So, so there hasn't there hasn't been an assessment so far in terms of the the, the percentage of people who may uh, be unable to to apply for this scheme um, if it moves online. Well, that that was that was part of the the initial uh, project work uh, where colleagues from across the water um, did some initial testing in Northern Ireland and. Uh, Whilst it was um, a very low sort of um, number of people that uh, were involved, um, uh, the findings were that it, it wouldn't be uh, an issue. And I think that's maybe particularly because we're sort of uh, aiming this um, at sort of the younger age group, you know, uh, expecting mothers on on people with younger children, um, and uh, the majority of those would be digitally aware. Um, I would suggest, uh, and and I accept that uh, not not everyone will have access, but uh, I will sort of uh, take that up with the project people and and see what the contingency is for that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John and Jerry. And going then to Carol Nicholin. Go ahead, Carol. So, um, thank you, John. I just feel that a sample of 20 people without knowing where the sample came from geographically is far too low. And with respect, John, and this isn't leveled at yourself, colleagues across the water are still getting... Uh, people who've got their names in Irish, like myself, their names wrong and their children's names wrong, which is causing delays. Um, the system doesn't allow for the language to have fathers. It holds claims back. Um, so that needs looked at. It wouldn't happen in Wales, but it happens here. So I want that looked at. I also think, to be honest, John, we need an equality impact assessment in this, and I'll tell you why. Because why? Younger people 
may be digitally aware, it doesn't mean that they, that they can still afford a device. Um, and I think the independent advice sector here has been invaluable to a lot of people. Our libraries are closed at the minute, and even for people in rural communities who couldn't get access to broadband and may have through their libraries, can't do that because they're closed from COVID restrictions. Um, I just feel this is almost tagging on to what happens across the water. And, and I, f I feel there's a lot more work still to be done. So I just want to put that on the record, Chair. Sure. And also the fact that yeah. we're still we're still catching up on the percentage of money. So at the minute, it's £3.10 a week to go up to £4.25 in April. Um, is that the situation just for here? Is that right across the board? Uh, no, that's that's maintained parity with uh, with across the water. That increase. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I go then to Pam Cameron. Go ahead, Pam, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah. Could I ask um, if the legislation governing this scheme is it domestic or is it contained in the retained EU law? And are there any impl implications for products provided under the voucher of the Protocol of Trade Dis Disruption um, East West? Oh, you're you're aware of my remit now. I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, Do you want to come back maybe with the response for something? In? Yeah. Um, sorry. Can you just uh, give me that again? So I was asking if the legislation governing this scheme um, is it domestic or is it contained or in the retained EU law? No, I, I, no, it's domestic. It's well, domestic. My, yeah, understanding. Yeah, it's not. Okay. It's not contained within EU, EU law at all. Okay, and could you tell me? Um, does the move to digitisation does it affect retail providers who are um, participants in the scheme? Um, the, the amending legislation uh, removes the requirement for retailers to register for the scheme. Um, so under digitization, um, whenever a person actually gets the digital uh, card, that can be presented uh, at uh, more retailers than uh, it could have been in the past. Any retailers that is prepared to accept the card. Okay. Um, can you tell us about steps are being taken to communicate the changes with the businesses? Yes, that, that that's been done uh, by the project people uh, across the water. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm not seeing any indications then from other members. I'll just check with the clerk if he's aware of any other indications at this point. No further indications um, from me, Chair. Okay, well, listen, John, thank you for coming along to our uh, meeting and, and taking part in our considerations there this morning. And um, I think there are a number of issues there, obviously, of concern that members would like um, addressed and, and looked at. But for now, we can we can let you go, John, and we'll continue our consideration. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, um, so members, um, there are a couple of issues of concern there, and I do I do think there is there is some uh, there is some obviously commitments to look at some of those issues. Um, it is something am I am I correct in saying, Clark, that that the committee can always look back again at any issue that it chooses to, if if concerns if concerns continue to be uh, raised or concerns are are out there, and also as we have in the past, if we can. We can agree the rule to allow the, the, the substantive work to continue, but also to note our concerns. That, yes, that, that, we, can, that, we can advise the, the Department of the issues that have been raised and seek further updates uh, at certain uh, put timelines in frame um, for when we're looking updates on that. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so what would what would be sort of a practical or realistic timeframes that, that maybe we can that we could that would typically be be uh, in a case like this? Um, it, it's purely up to the, the, the committee on this. Um, certainly, I would imagine with the um, system being up and getting started and up and running, um, you probably want to give it at least a, a month or two to see how it, how it's going. I think there are some things that we can get responses on pretty quickly, but in relation to review, again, I would probably suggest two to three months. Okay. Uh, would members be would members be content? Would, three months is twelve weeks, I suppose. Maybe that would be a realistic time to, for for issues to emerge and feed through. Yeah. Cheryl, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, sure. I don't think any of us want to hold this back. You know, this is money getting into people's purses and pockets that's needed. But the issue is, like, no disrespect to John, I just felt that was a very shoddy presentation. Um, not really prepared, and um, there are really serious questions that need to be asked. So the questions that were raised, I would like them to go into the department for a, a better response. Yeah. Yeah, our members agreed that we put those questions in for a response and that we schedule a review around approximately 12 weeks' time to see how this is rolling out on the ground. Would members be content with both those? Okay. Okay. Thank you, members. So um, I will then ask formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 26, the Healthy Start Scheme and Daycare Food Scheme, Amendment Regulations NA 2021. And has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Okay, and that's that's pending that further information that's that's contingent on that further information and us completing a review of that. Okay, thank you. So members, I'm going to take a short break there uh, before we move on to correspondence. And if members could return back at twelve thirty-five, please, we will resume back in session. Can I ask Clerk to bring the broadcasting to an end temporarily? Just wait a confirmation, Chair. So twenty. Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. <clears throat> That's us live now, Chair. Thank you, Clerk. Okay, members, thank you for returning and we re resume our meeting. Uh, so I refer you there, members, to papers at tab 8 of your pack relating to correspondence. And there's two items that I wish to draw attention to members of today. Item 8.7 there is a departmental response to the issues raised during the budget briefing. Do members have any comments to make on, the, on in relation to that correspondence? No indication to this point. So are members therefore content to note? Yep, content to note. Thank you, members. Item 8.7. One zero is a departmental response to the committee's request for further information on the terms of reference for the public inquiry on urology. Have members any comments they wish to make in relation to that item? No? Okay, members content to, therefore to note? Yeah, thank you. Um, item 8.18 is a request from Tiny Life to brief the committee. Given the current pressures on the forward work program, I maybe suggest that a member or members would volunteer to arrange an informal briefing session um, along the lines of, of what we've discussed for other um, groups. Would members be content to note would, would members be content with that approach? Like I'm not sure. Um, and is there any members who Yes, go ahead, Orlea. Um, yeah, so I, I have already held a meeting with um, Tiny Life, obviously separate to the committee. Um, but I think that it, it probably would be worthwhile um, doing that, that informal session with them. Um, and because I'm conscious with the Fort Work programme, but even if I could slot them into that, those speed dating sessions that we're talking about, but I don't know how soon they're going to happen. But I would be concerned. Um, that there is an issue with Tiny Life who provide a really critical service in the neonatal units and within the community um, that they are um, having to consider withdrawing their services within Belfast, which is the largest neonatal unit in the north. 
Um, so there, there is serious issues there and I think it might be worthwhile if members are up for doing that additional or informal session with them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and what a time to have a bit of background noise coming in from obviously a very small, uh, a small child or baby there somewhere in somebody's background. And earlier, would you be content, and along with if any other members are content to, would you be content to arrange that on behalf of the committee, facilitate the committee in that respect? Uh, yes, that's no problem. I'm sorry the baby's on my end. It's my newborn nephew. <laughs> well, uh, I don't think there's any. No, I don't think. I think I think that uh, I don't think anybody's complaining too much about about that. It's a it's a, it's a nice it's a nice noise at any time. Um, I have an indication there. So if members are content with that. I'm not sure if Jerry is looking to speak on that. I'll just check. Jerry, is it on that issue? Sure, it was just a, a previous item. Well, just give me one second then. So members then are content that 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 arrange that earlier, and and another member if they wish to assist with that would would pull that meeting together. So I'll go to you then, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. I was just trying to get uh, my hand up before you moved on, but it was uh, 811, uh, the, the correspondence from the uh, Phoenix Law and the Birth Mothers uh, group, the request to, to, to meet the committee. We had a meeting there three weeks ago, I think it was, uh, with some of the uh, campaigners, but I, I think it would be useful, uh, given next week's uh, session, if we could get a, um, a quick meeting um, uh, with the group uh, before the um, chair of the, the working group uh, addresses the committee. So I don't know if that's possible with scheduling, uh, but I would like to suggest that a, as a possibility because obviously there's a lot of concerns that uh, the group are raising uh, in regards to uh, an inquiry that they feel need to happen. So I would like to suggest that we have a, um, a specific uh, session, um, even if it is brief with the group uh, next Thursday before the, we hear from the, the chair of the working group. Um, well, funny, I had I had noted the correspondence as well, and I thought it was timely in that sense. I, it was it was my sort of view of looking at it, having had that quite quite a good session with them quite recently, at which at which they were were there. I I would have thought in terms of sequencing, it would be better to get the department briefing and then be able to follow that up with that group to see how that department briefing had. Um, were there issues that they had with it or whatever? So, but I'm I'm, I'm open to discussion. I see Paula indicating. Um, thank you, Chair. I do appreciate that everything's now started moving very quickly in terms of the mother and baby home stuff. I suppose if it's, there's not an opportunity through the health committee structure, then I suppose um, I know that birth mothers and Children for Justice have been organising some Zoom meetings at night for their members, new and old. So I suppose we could possibly seek to, outside the, this structure, actually myself, Jerry, and anybody else, we could actually probably meet over the next week before that. Because I do think that while the um, event that Judith Gillespie and the department organised was, was very valuable, I'm not sure we had the opportunity to really drill down in terms of the aspiration of, of the, their members. So um, I'm happy to take that on personally to set up a meeting if we can't go through the health committee structures. Okay, okay, yeah, that might be that might be because there is there is a fair amount of work uh, piling up, but that, that is an important issue. So maybe Jerry and Jerry and Paulo, if you if you facilitate that session. Members are, as always, able to attend. But at the very least, at the very least, there will be a report back to the committee, maybe to inform our considerations. Yeah, so members agreed and content with that. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to work with Paul on yeah, that. And then I think if the group still, I think there's a there's probably a desire to get some information. I'm sure on the record from the group uh, from the various groups. So maybe if we can take that in, into consideration and, and schedule them in, uh, and maybe in a few weeks' time, if that's possible, I think it would be worthwhile. But I'm happy to work with, with Paula for next week. Okay. Okay. Thank you, members. Um, moving on then to a. So in relation to any other items of correspondence, do members have any comments or proposals on any other items of correspondence there before we go to table papers? I haven't dealt with table papers yet. So are members otherwise content then with the actions as proposed on the correspondence memo? Yeah, members content, thank you. Moving on to table correspondence then, the table pack contains a further item of correspondence from the department at tab 8.25 there, which provides the first fortnightly update on the pressures on mental health services due to the pandemic. Members will recall that we asked for this in relation to one of the SRs that was brought that was brought forward. Do, do members have any comments or content that they wish to note in relation to that? Sure, sorry. No, not, not a problem. Yes. Go ahead, Arlene. Yeah. I think I'm low on the phone. Um, 
but it's just to say I, I was glad to see that in the table papers because I know it was something that the the team had agreed to provide for us um, for for the sake of just sort of monitoring how that process is rolling out. So I was just glad to see that, and hopefully we can continue to get those updates because it's important to know how that's how that's progressing. Ch Chair. Yeah. Yes, Paula, go ahead. Um, Chair, it's my understanding um, that one of the, the ladies who's affected by this, I, I think that they would dispute some of or, or question some of the content of, of that letter. So I'm just wondering um, if we can maybe put this on the agenda to come back to you next week when I get a wee bit more information. It was just this morning I was advised that there, there appeared to be a bit of discrepancy. So I think it's a, it's a live issue and we, we need to keep on top of it. Okay, will members be content that we reschedule back for a look at that next week again? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, members, moving on then to the forward work program, uh, which is a tab 9.1 of your pack there. Um, are members content to note the forward work program? Yeah. And I can advise members that at next week's meeting, we're due to get briefed by the Department on waiting times. So, in order to help members' consideration of that issue, um, it, it was I think a good idea to speak with the Royal College of Surgeons, who I know have engaged with, with some of us around their concerns. I think that would be useful to have in advance of the meeting. Um, we could arrange, we, we have arranged a session on the Wednesday at 11 a.m. Um, so I would be grateful if you could let the clerk know if you're available to attend that session um, at 11 a.m. next Wednesday with the Royal College of Surgeons. I think that would help our, our scrutiny of the, the briefing to a huge degree. So could members please advise the clerk of their availability? Thank you. Members, any other business then? No. So a date, time and place then of our next meeting. Our next meeting will be on Thursday, the 11th of March at 9.30 a.m. via video link. So thank you, members. And can we come, uh, can we end the broadcasting session, please, clerk? <laughs>